In this course, you're going to learn how to create animations like these and these and these. Whether you're just starting out or you're looking to enhance your skills, this course will help you bring your website to life by learning about motion design. You see, in the world of web design, every pixel, every line of code comes to life through motion. And it's not just about making things move, it's about telling a story, guiding the users, and creating experiences that are both intuitive and delightful. Now, together, we'll dive into the principles of motion design, we'll explore cutting-edge tools and techniques, and we'll learn how to apply them in practical, real-world scenarios. But hey, for just meaning, my name is Adi, and I've been around the web space for over a decade now doing both design and development. And I still remember how static websites used to be, how lifeless. Um, occasionally, you would find a website made in Flash, which had some sort of movement in it, and you would be like, whoa, Here's an example I found on a web design museum. Apparently, this is the website of Lenny Kravitz from 2003. The animations might not seem amazing right now, but they were pretty cool back then. Today, it's a different story. You can create amazing animations with just CSS. And if you add a bit of JavaScript, then you can take things to a whole new level. So. I think this course is perfect for anyone who wants to step up their game in this area. And I'm here to share all my insights and all my knowledge on this subject so uh, you can transform your designs from good to jaw dropping. We're going to start by learning about videos, how to add them to a web page, how to set them as backgrounds, and also how to load them in custom players. We'll discover how CSS transitions can be used to animate simple elements like buttons and menus, but also entire galleries or custom apps. We'll create some cool loading animations. We'll play around with illustrations, icons, and Lottie files while discovering the best ways of adding motion with these. We'll create animated logos and we'll turn a static piece of text into a dynamic headline. We'll create interactive animations that are triggered by our own action, either that's hovering on a button or scrolling up and down the page. We'll also add depth and dimension to our projects with parallax, and we're going to create this beautiful animated hero. Now, this course features 19 practical exercises, and if you want to follow along, you can download a starter kit by using the links in the video description. So. If you want to code alongside me while watching this course, grab the kit and let's get to work. Uh, before we do that, uh, I want to quickly mention that this course is brought to you by Envato Elements. Envato Elements is your gateway to unlimited creativity. A single subscription grants you access to a wealth of digital assets like stunning photos, captivating videos, beautiful fonts, and eye-catching graphics. Supercharge your search with the power of AI to find assets tailored to your project. For more information, check out the links in the video description. All right, so let's jump straight into it and learn the basics of motion design for the web. All right, let's begin by talking about motion design in general. Motion design is a creative discipline that uses animation and visual effects to bring static elements to life. It involves manipulating visual elements like text, illustrations, and images to create engaging and dynamic motion graphics. This is used in many different places, such as film titles, user interfaces, advertisements, and videos. Motion design plays a vital role in visual storytelling and communication. For example, with motion graphics, you can create a really cool app promo video just like this one. Or a really nicely animated video title like this one. And nowadays, with the abundance of video templates available on Innovato Elements, for example, it's really easy to add that uh, much needed pizzazz 
to your visuals. But let's be honest, you're here because you want to spice up your web game, right? We're talking about taking those plain old two-dimensional websites and web apps and uh, kitting them with some serious movement and depth. So it's time to unleash the power of the Trinity. Uh, So, it's time to unleash the power of the Trinity. And the Trinity consists of, surprise, three things. Videos, transitions, and animations. And together, they're like the Avengers of the web design world, ready to swoop in and save your digital creations from boredom. Let's start with videos. These are like the Hulk of the group, very efficient in delivering information in um, a truly smashing way. Well, we all know the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Meaning a picture, an image can describe something a lot more efficiently than written or spoken words. Well, based on that, we can say that a video is worth a thousand pictures. That's because videos I have this magical ability of blending visuals, audio, motion and storytelling, uh, leaving individual images or written descriptions feeling a bit inadequate. Now, prepare yourself for a peek into Apple's world of video mastery as they showcase their newest creation, the Vision Pro Mixed Reality Headset. They've got the perfect combo here, written text for information and background videos to say, hey, this is what you'll experience when using our new headset. And let me tell you, some of these videos are out of this world. There's this one, for instance, that takes you on an intergalactic joyride while watching a movie. It's like entering a whole new reality, a whole new dimension. And watching that video will evoke emotions in a way that's not really possible just by reading a piece of text, no matter how detailed that text is. But videos are not the only way to add motion to the web. Uh, our dynamic trio would not be complete without animations and transitions. Now, these are like the Hawkeye and Black Widow of the group sleek and precise in their roles. But just like these two, transitions and animations are similar, yet different. Transitions smoothly guide us from one state to the other, adding an extra layer of finesse. Take for example the color and position change on these links. See how smoothly the properties change between the default and mouse over states, this is way, way better than a sudden change. And that's because it mimics real life. Uh, if I have my hand up and I move it from side to side like this, you can clearly see the transition between the two positions, right? Uh, in real life, you don't perceive movement like this. Okay, it's, it's unnatural. Now, of course, you don't always need to implement transitions. It really depends on the style you're going for. In this example, all color changes happen instantly, which makes the UI feel very snappy. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In the end, it's about personal preference. Now, animations, while similar to transitions in the sense that they change from one state to another uh, are also very different. And we'll explore the differences between these two later in the course. Uh, but for now, just know this. Animations allow us to create much more complex movement than transitions. Now, if we're going to go back to the Avengers analogy, I would say transitions are like Hawkeye, capable, very straightforward, but in the end, kind of limited in his skill set. I mean, the guy shoots arrows, right? Animations, on the other hand, would be represented by Black Widow. While still human, 
Uh, she can do a whole lot more. She can uh, shoot guns, ride bikes, uh, go all Jackie Chan on you. She can zap you with stuff on her wrist and so on. Now, let's take a look at some animations. And uh, we'll start with this one from Dog Studio. This is one of my favorite websites because it's about dogs, except it isn't. But here you'll see this amazing animation of the dog as we scroll up and down the page. This is definitely one of the more unique ways of adding motion to a website, but I think it's mesmerizing to anyone who sees it. But not all animations are flashy. In his portfolio website, Dennis uses some very tasteful animations in the hero area. And also when we hover on certain elements like this button or these portfolio items. So quite a big difference between animations and transitions, but they both have their purpose. And along with videos, they help us add motion to the web. Now, why should we care about adding motion? I mean, it looks cool, but is it actually helpful? The answer is definitely yes. You see, motion enhances the user experience. So, for example, if I'm browsing a website, I'm going to have a good experience if I find the information that I'm looking for quickly. Uh, but the experience is going to be even better if the information is delivered in a dynamic and engaging way. And this is exactly what videos, transitions, and animations do. With that said, motion has two main purposes, informative and aesthetic. It's informative because you can use motion to show users how to interact with the UI or even show them what actions are available. For example, Dennis uses animated buttons or rather they become animated on hover. This is telling users that the element is interactive, that clicking it will do something, right? The animation can also be very subtle. In this example, we can see a short animated element under the scroll text. This is telling us in a very subtle way that, hey, you can scroll down to see more content. Here's another great example of an informative animation. The Dog Studio website plays music by default, and the way we turn it on or off is by clicking this tiny button on the bottom right corner. And to make that very obvious for the users, the button has the simple ripple animation that draws your attention. And so you immediately know, oh, okay, so this is an interactive element. Now, being informative, motion also has the ability of focusing a user's attention to something important. So let's say we have some product features that we want to showcase. To get the user to focus on those, we can animate images like we see here. And this works great because when I get to this section, my eyes are immediately drawn to the area. So those are just a few examples of how motion can be informative. Now, the second purpose is aesthetic. That's for adding personality or character to your, uh, to your web project. And uh, a good example uh, for this would be a loading screen. Dog Studio does a great job with this because it shows this loading animation of a dog running. This is great because it's in tune with the brand and the rest of the website, and it helps build that unique character. We can also see a great example of aesthetic animation on Dennis's website. Notice how these two rows of images shift position on scroll. This is a really nice effect. It doesn't serve uh, an informative purpose, but aesthetically, it looks fantastic. It adds personality and style to an otherwise standard layout. So, in this lesson, we learned that motion design is a discipline that uses animation and visual effects to bring static elements to life. You can use motion design in a bunch of places like film titles, user interfaces, 
advertisements and videos. When it comes to the web, we can add motion by using videos, transitions, and animations. Videos can deliver information in a very dynamic and effective way because they're a blend of visuals, audio, motion, and storytelling. Transitions are effects that gradually change the properties of an element from one state to another, and they're best used for simple from to movements. Animations are similar to transitions, but they allow for more complex and continuous motion. And finally, we learned that motion has two main purposes, informative and aesthetic. Motion is informative because it can show users how to interact with the UI and what actions are available. It can even focus the user's attention to something important. Motion is aesthetic because it can be used to add personality and style to a standard layout. But of course, the most important key takeaway from this lesson is that Hawkeye is not as cool as Black Widow. And with that, it's time to move on to some practical stuff. So in the next lesson, we're going to learn how to add videos to a web page. Okay, so earlier I said something about videos being worth a thousand pictures and that videos uh, use visuals, audio, motion, and storytelling to deliver information very effectively. They're essentially the superheroes of content delivery. Now, the beneficial effects of adding videos to your website are well documented. For example, this article from Incivia gives us some great stats, like explainer videos are capable of increasing product sales by 20%. Cool. And uh, since this is written on the internet, it must be true, right? Regardless, um, we all know that videos are the future of content. So let's see how other websites are using video and then learn how to add videos to our web pages. And by the way, if you want to follow along with uh, this uh, course, you can download uh, all the exercises. Uh, you'll find a starter kit that's linked in the video description along with any other resource I used in this course. And uh, by the way, if you're enjoying this course so far, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and uh, turn on notifications for more content like this. Okay, let's see some real world examples. Let's start on Apple's website, and we're looking at the presentation page for their uh, newest iMac. And as we scroll down, we can see our really nice presentation video for, um, for their iMac showcasing the uh, seven colors uh, it comes in. And as we scroll even further down, we can see another video. This is a type of a slideshow where we can see the various use cases for this device. And it goes on further as we scroll down and we can see another video being played here. And as we scroll down even further, we can see another video uh, that's showcasing yet another feature of the product, which is the six speaker sound system in this case. And the examples can go on and on. So showcasing the characteristics or the features of a certain product is a great reason for using a video. Uh, moving on to the iOS 17 page, again, on the Apple website. And here, we're not dealing with a physical product, but instead, a digital one. And here, we can also see videos being used to display how that digital product works. We can always click replay. And we can see that now the video is being actually displayed inside this uh, this iPhone uh, mockup, which really adds to the to the whole realism of uh, of this presentation here. And again, the examples can uh, can go on and on. We have some more uh, videos here, again showcasing uh, other features of the uh, of the operating system. Uh, moving on, we have the Timely website, and uh, Timely is basically a time tracking software, 
And again, they're using video right here in their, um, well, it's not exactly in the hero section, but they're using it to uh, show their app and how it looks like, what it can do. And this is uh, using a really nice animation. Next, uh, let's move on to the Envision apps page. And if we go to freehand and we scroll down, we can again see uh, a presentation of their software and they show you exactly what uh, you can do with it. And it's presented really nicely. As you can see, the videos can have different uh, kind of containers. I showed you uh, one type of container here where it's placed in um, in this iPhone mockup on Timely's website. It uh, looks a little bit different. It has a, a rounded border. Uh, here, it's a little bit more square and it has a shadow. So uh, you can really customize the way the video container looks like. And finally, we go to Sh uh, Sakuro Shakuro and uh, they are using video as background for their hero area. Uh, again, showing, uh, you know, stuff related to their business, like uh, maybe their portfolio items, stuff they worked on, and uh, maybe even uh, like we see here, pictures of people working, I'm assuming from their offices. Now, let's focus on the technical side and learn how to add videos to our own web pages. So enter practical exercise number one. So here we have a simple page. Uh, I just have uh, some feature title description and some sub features. And let's say we want to add a video right here on the right side. So if you open up exercise one, you'll see that we have a div uh, with an idea of media, right? So uh, let's say we want to add a video there. Well, the easiest way is let's say we have our video hosted on YouTube. Okay, so uh, I'm going to grab this video from the Envato Tuts Plus channel. And the way you embed it, basically, or the way you load it onto your web page is you go to share, you click embed, and you copy this embed code, okay, you can also uh, hit this button. So you copy that, you come in here, you paste it in, save. And now we have a What's video a that's running, that's loaded directly there. And because it's a YouTube video, you know, we, we have uh, all the play options that you would normally expect on YouTube. And that's the easiest way you can uh, add a video to your web page. But what if you have a custom video? What if you have one that's hosted on your site? So for example, in my uh, source files here, I have a video called video1.mp4, which looks something like this. Uh, by the way, you may not see this in the starter kit that you're downloading because this is taken from Envato Elements and I cannot redistribute it. It's a copyright thing. So in the starter kit, you'll most likely find some kind of replacement video. But uh, for the purposes of, uh, of this demo, uh, that will work just as well. Me personally, I'm going to use some assets from Envato Elements in this course and in the other demos as well. But uh, if you can't find those in your starter kit, you would have to download them yourself or uh, just find a replacement uh, on your own. Okay, so let's assume that I have this video one and I want to load it right here. Okay, so let's comment this. We can use the video element. So we're going to say video SRC. We're going to go to videos video one, and we can hit save. So now if we refresh, yeah, we can see that video being loaded on the right side of my content, but it's like super big. How do we make this smaller? Super simple to do that. We have some attributes we can use on the video element, such as width height. So we can say width, uh, let's do 640 pixels. Uh, we can do a height of like 320 pixels. And now, the video is displayed properly at a much better dimension. But it doesn't play. 
or actually it doesn't show us any kind of controls. Well, the thing with the video element is we can right click it on any browser and you know we can have the option to show all controls. So we can play, we can pause, we can scrub, we can make it full screen and we have some additional options here. And we can also choose to loop it, which means when it gets to the end, it's going to go back to the beginning, right? It's just going to keep playing over and over again. Now, what if I don't want to have to right click uh, to display those controls? Very simple. We have another attribute called controls. And that's going to display the controls I showed you earlier by default. And if your video has um, audio, it has sound, and you don't want that playing, uh, you can also use the muted attribute, and that's going to play, as you can see here, it, uh, it has a crossed uh, speaker icon. So it's going to play muted. Something else you can do is you can add a poster. So by default, if the video uh, is loaded and it's not playing, it's going to show probably like uh, an, a still image from the first few frames or even the first frame of the video. But if you want to add like a, uh, a separate image, a standalone image, uh, you can do that by using the poster attribute. So you can say here poster equals and you would give it a path to an image. Uh, in my case, I have an image called videoposter.jpg. So now that image is displayed instead of whatever it was before. Really cool. Now, in case the browser you're using doesn't support the video element or the video tag, you can actually uh, put some text in here, something like this. Your browser doesn't support HTML5 video tag. So if the browser doesn't support it, it's not going to show the video. Instead, it's going to show this piece of text. This is uh, just a fallback, really. But nowadays, all major browsers support video, so you shouldn't uh, have this issue. Now, how exactly do you customize uh, the way this video container looks like? Well, the answer is with CSS. So in here, I'm using, by the way, for all of these demos, I'm using uh, like internal CSS. It's just a little bit easier. So to style that, yeah, you would say the following. Uh, first of all, we have a, a div ID media, which contains all of this. So you would say media, video, and you can do a lot of things. You can uh, add, I don't know, a border radius, for example, let's say one rem, and that's gonna round it off. I'm not sure if you can see it here. Uh, but you can also add a border to it, right? So let's say border, if I can type border, one pixel solid, and let's give it a color like 5521 dB, right? And that adds a nice purple border around it. Uh, what about this poster image? It's, it doesn't fill like the entire video container because of the, of the aspect ratio of the image. So to get around that, you could say object fit cover, save, and there you go. Now the image fills up the entire video container. And by the way, this also works for, uh, for the iframe. So if you don't have a video here, and instead you wanna use you know, the iframe instead, uh, you can do that as well, just add the um, the CSS there as well, the selector. And now the iframe or the stuff that you got from YouTube as an embed has the uh, has the rounded corner and the uh, colored border. On top of that, if you want to customize this further, you can use a library called videojs. So you basically go to videojs.com and you can see some of the examples of the players or the player themes that uh, that you can use, and um, you know you'll find all the uh, the instructions on how to customize things in here. We're not going to do that right now, but videojs.com, 
and you can uh, make your video player look any way you want. Now, let's take a look at another exercise where we have a simple hero area with a header, some text, a little icon here, but there's something missing, right? How about we add a video as a background to the to this entire section? How exactly would we do that? Because uh, we can't just go into CSS, uh, go into the hero and say, okay, background image, and uh, we'll just load the video. That It doesn't work like that. So we kind of have to work around that, uh, that limitation. So here's what we do. Uh, let's take a look at the structure first. We have uh, the section with an idea of hero. This is basically the container for everything we have here on the top. Then we have the header, the h1, and the image. That's this one here. Now, to add a video as a background, we will create a video element, and then we're going to absolutely position that and stretch it to fill the entire hero, and we're going to position it behind all the other elements. Here's how you do that. First of all, let's create the video element. So in here, and by the way, you can uh, create this anywhere you want inside the hero, but I'm going to put it right here as the uh, as the first element. So we're going to say video. Uh, so let's go to videos, and I'm going to load this, uh, M this mp4, video2.mp4. And here I'm going to set uh, two extra attributes. I'm going to set autoplay and also mute it. And uh, let's actually do one more. We'll set loop so that it just keeps on uh, repeating itself. And as you can see, the video is now displayed, although it's the wrong size and it's positioned incorrectly. But we can easily fix that from CSS. So let's go and target the video element. We're going to set position to absolute. And by the way, for this to work, we first need to set a position relative on the hero element, which I've done like right here. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So we're going to say video position absolute. And we're going to set top zero left zero. Okay, so now it starts from the top left corner. And let's set a width 100% height 100%. Okay. And now for the magical stuff, object fit cover. And that's going to basically fill up the entire available space. It's going to clip the video on the top and bottom. And now all we got to do is move it behind everything else. So we'll just set a Z index of two, uh, sorry, minus two. And that's going to put it behind everything else. Now, I already made some preparations beforehand. And those preparations look like this. So uh, on the hero, I have a before pseudo element defined that has a background of 80% of this color, right? And it also has a Z index of minus one. Z index minus one basically puts it under all the content inside the hero, because that's by default Z index zero. So I'm adding this color overlay. So what I did with the video is I did basically the same thing, but I set a Z index of minus two. So now the video goes behind that color overlay and the rest of the content goes on top. All right, so now we know how to load videos on a web page. So we're done, right? Ah, but not so fast. You see, performance is also something that we need to consider. Let's take a look at the file size of the first video we loaded. If we go to uh, to VS Code here and we open up the first video, we can see that it has a whopping file size of 59.80 megabytes, so about 60 megabytes. That's massive for a 10 second video. Now this loaded just fine for me because I'm working locally, but imagine this video was hosted uh, somewhere and I had to download it uh, with a slow mobile connection, right? It would take forever. And personally, I'm not going to wait for that. I'm not going to wait a minute, two minutes uh, to download a video. 
well, <laughs> unless it's a funny cat video. But anyway, uh, most people will not wait for it to download. So performance really is critical. Now, what can we do in this situation? What can we do uh, to lower uh, that file size? Well, first of all, we can use a different file format, a, a different video format, okay? And so far in this course, we used the MP4 format, which is like the gold standard for video. Uh, most of the time, this uses the H.264 codec, which offers great quality and is supported by all media players and browsers, even older ones. Now, the MP4 format is like the Batman, reliable and versatile, but a bit slow at times. And just like Batman, MP4 files are a bit on the larger side. But MP4 is not the only format supported by modern browsers. WebM is also really good. It's an open source format developed by Google specifically for web video. And the WebM format is like the Flash. Super fast, very lightweight, but not as reliable. So when comparing WebM to MP4, the WebM files um, tend to have smaller sizes at similar quality levels, but uh, they're not as reliable in terms of browser support because they're not supported by some older browsers, okay? Now, let's say you have a bunch of MP4 files that you want to slim down. You want to convert them to WebM to reduce their file size. How do you do that? Well, let me show you. You can use an app called Handbrake, and Handbrake looks something like this. Uh, you can get it by going to handbrake.fr. You can download it here for Windows and for other platforms. It's free. It's awesome. Go and get it. So let's, uh, let's work on this uh, second exercise here. Let's say I want to convert this uh, background video from an MP4 to a WebM. Right? And our background video is video2.mp4. As you can see, I already uh, converted it here. But let's take a look at the file size of this. So it's 5.26 megabytes. And the way we convert it is we open the source, we select the video, and here we select the format, WebM. We can select the preset here for the resolution, and we can save this in the same folder, and you click Start Encode. Okay, and that's going to do its thing. And now we are done. So now we have this uh, WebM file here. Of course, uh, VS Code cannot uh, load it properly. But now, if we look at the file size, it's about half of what we had here, 5.26 megabytes, 2.54 megabytes. So now, with the video converted, how about we add it to our page? And here, I actually want to show you a different way of adding videos. And that's by skipping the SRC attribute here, and instead using this source, and then SRC, and we're going to go to videos. Uh, first, let's load the MP4, and I'm going to set a type of video slash MP4. And then I'm going to duplicate it, and I'm going to select the WebM version and choose WebM right here. So now, if we take a look, and actually, let me comment this bit, the MP4 source. Uh, now the WebM video is loaded, and it looks just fine, but it's lower file size, which is great for us. Uh, the reason I'm using this approach is that if a browser cannot or doesn't support WebM, it's going to use MP4 as a fallback. But uh, by default, browsers will generally prefer WebM. Uh, also, when working with video, please pay attention to the resolution of that video because that plays a huge part when it comes to the file size. A higher resolution video will, of course, have a bigger file size than a lower resolution video. But in most cases, you will not need a 4K video. Like 
for instance, in the example that I showed you here, uh, with the background video, you don't need a 4K video there, but 1080p will do just fine, right? So also think about the resolution uh, when using videos onto your web page, because um, you're gonna, or you'll most likely be in a situation where you're gonna bog down your page, you're gonna make it load super slowly, just because you're using a higher resolution video when you don't have to, okay? So keep that in mind. So in this lesson, we learned that videos are the superheroes of content delivery. Loading videos from external sources is a breeze with simple embed codes, making it easy to add them to web pages. If you're self-hosting the videos, you can use the video HTML element to add them anywhere on the page. You can fine tune the video functionality by using attributes like autoplay, muted, loop, and controls. Controlling the appearance of the video player can be easily done by using frameworks like Video.js. You need to always optimize video format and size to ensure faster page loading times. In terms of video format, MP4 is a reliable option that is supported by all browsers and media players. WebM is also viable, and while it's not as widely supported as MP4, it offers smaller file sizes without sacrificing quality. To compress a video or convert it to a different format, you can use the free app Handbrake. All right, that's a wrap for videos, and we've officially tackled the first member of our dynamic trio. Now, it's time to shift gears and dive into the amazing world of CSS transitions. CSS transitions are like the smooth operator at a party, guiding elements through changes and making your website look sleek and sophisticated. CSS transitions are a functionality provided by CSS that enables smooth and gradual changes in element properties over a specified duration. They provide a way to add animation and visual effects to elements without using JavaScript or other complex coding. Now, do not confuse CSS transitions with CSS animations. We've talked about this before. Remember the Hawkeye dude? Uh, so CSS transitions are pretty limited in terms of what they can do because they basically animate a property from point A to point B. There's nothing in between. It's like shooting an arrow, if you want. The arrow goes from the bow to its target. It doesn't do anything in between. It doesn't stop for coffee mid-flight, okay? The same goes for transitions. There's nothing in between. They go from point A to point B. So let me show you how you can create some in CSS. Let's work on practical exercise number three, where we have a simple header that has a logo and a navigation. The navigation has a button that's, uh, you know, it kind of looks like a button, but it doesn't behave like a button. So we're all used to a button being an interactive element, meaning when we uh, get the mouse cursor over it, it does something, it changes color, or it gets bigger, or something along those lines. But this doesn't do anything. So uh, let's fix that. Let's go to our CSS in exercise three. And let's say the following, uh, sorry, btn. So we have a class defined here. On hover, uh, we can do the following background color, we're going to change it to 151618. And we're going to change the color to white. So now, if we hover on it, it changes color. Pretty cool, right? How about we add a transition to that? And the way we add a transition is we target the original element, so btn, and we say transition property, what are we changing? We're changing the background color, right? How long should this transition be? Let's say 400 milliseconds. So we can say transition duration, we can do 400 ms or 0.4 or 0.4 seconds. Okay, 
So now, the same thing happens, but it's now very smooth. It's transitioned, right? It's animated from the purple color to the dark color. It's not as abrupt as before. Now we can do a lot more with this. We can uh, specify a timing function. So we can say transition timing function. Let's do an ease in out. And that's gonna basically change the curve of the animation. So it's it looks just a little bit different. It's actually kind of hard to see on a color change. But as the course progresses, we'll uh, we'll talk more and more about um, timing functions. And we can also give it a delay if we want to. So we're going to say transition delay, let's say two seconds. And that's going to basically start the transition after two seconds. Okay, so I hover one, two, and then it does the transition. And it does the same when I hover out one, two, and it does the uh, transition in reverse. Now, these properties can be condensed in a shorthand notation. So instead of doing all of this, we can simply say transition, and we specify the property, in our case, background color, the duration, the timing function, and if we need to, the delay, two seconds like that. Okay, and you'll see that it now behaves exactly the same. And let me just remove that delay. We don't need it for uh, for this exercise. So instead of using these four properties or these three properties, uh, we can use just one called transition and we place the, uh, uh, the values in here. Now, if we want, we can transition multiple properties. So let's assume that instead of this, Instead of this, we're going to change the background color to white. Uh, I'm going to change the color to that uh, dark one we had before. And I'm going to change the border color to the same value. Okay, so now it looks like this. But notice that the background is transitioned, but not the other properties. So we get a, a really weird effect where the uh, border and the text color is changed instantly while the background is transitioned. So to fix that, we can add a comma here. And then again, color 0.4 seconds, ease in out or whatever easing we want, we can specify different easings for different properties. And we also want to transition the border color, we can put a different duration if we want here, although it's not necessary in this case. 0.4 seconds ease in and out. Okay, so now everything transitions at the same time, and we get a really nice effect. If we want, we can also specify transition all properties 0.4 seconds ease in and out. And that's, we don't have to worry about anything, any property that can be transitioned on this element will be transitioned. And even though this is um, uh, easier and more convenient. I don't recommend you do this because it's not very good in terms of performance. Uh, you're going to give the browser a lot of tasks and you're going to be uh, animating some properties that don't really need to be animated. Now, before we wrap up, let me anticipate uh, one of your questions, and that is Adi, why does the transition need to be applied on the element itself and not the pseudo class, for example, well, uh, two reasons for that. When you're attaching the uh, transition to the element itself, okay, you have more control over how the animation behaves. And a reason two is that when you're applying it here, whenever the properties change, the transition will be applied regardless of what triggered the change, right? So it's either uh, hover or press or focus. If you were to specify it on the pseudo class, like we have here, uh, you need to do it for all of them for you know, the hover, the press, whatever it is, it's much easier to specify it here on the uh, on the main selector on the element selector. In this lesson, we learned that CSS transitions are a CSS feature 
that allows for smooth and gradual changes in element properties. CSS transitions are different than CSS animations, mainly because they go from point A to point B with nothing in between. Applying transitions in CSS is done by using the transition property, transition duration, transition timing function, and transition delay properties. You can also use the shorthand notation of transition. You can transition multiple elements at the same time by separating them with commas. The browser can be instructed to transition all available properties at the same time by using the value all. However, this should be avoided due to possible performance issues. All right, so in this lesson, I showed you the basics of working with CSS transitions, but I haven't really focused on creating motion with them. So how about we do that next? In this lesson, we'll dive into the realm of CSS transitions and see how they can transform static elements into dynamic visual experiences. And before we do that ourselves, I think it's only appropriate to see how others are using transitions. And we start with the portfolio website of Simon. Um, as you can see, when we hover on these cards here, we have a really nice effect. We, uh, we get a shadow added behind the card. And also the background image, if this is a background image indeed, uh, it kind of shrinks a little bit creating this very smooth transition. And of course, uh, the same thing happens on the others. And I think the card itself actually scales up just a tiny bit. So yeah, a really simple transition, but one that uh, adds a lot of style to, uh, to a relatively simple layout. Uh, let's move on to Marie Weber's website. And here we can see that when we hover on these titles, there are a number of things going on. First of all, the text or the small badge on the top right of each title changes to reveal a bigger text. And it's doing so with a very simple, a very smooth transition. And also the images on the right side reduce their opacity, they scale up or down. And it's another great example of how to use transitions to add motion to a website. Moving on to Miti Navi. If we scroll all the way down to the footer, we can see these links. And when we hover on each link, we can see a nice transition. The original text kind of scrolls up or uh, slides up and then another text slides in from the bottom. Very simple effect, very cool. And again, one that adds just a little bit of motion to this website. And finally, we go to Vool Studio, which has a lot of transitions here. And we can see the first one, if we uh, scroll up and down, we can see this sticky header just popping down. Yeah, so it goes, it changes position, it goes from the top to the bottom, and it also transitions the opacity of that element. Again, when we hover on these cards, they kind of scale up and they change their background, and all of these properties are uh, transitioned. And then when we scroll down uh, from the top, actually, you can see that the uh, entire page background changes from this dark blue to this white. And that's also a transition. Not to mention the buttons also transition, right? And they have this uh, cool uh, mouse cursor follow effect, which we'll actually uh, replicate in one of, the, uh, one of our future lessons. But inside the button, yeah, you can also see a transition. Uh, it's kind of like a wipe effect uh, for the background color of the button. So that's how other websites incorporate transitions to add motion. Now, these transitions are not used just for buttons and links. Uh, they've got a much broader role to play. And to show you that, 
I've uh, created a couple of demos. So let's start with practical exercise number four. Let's look at a simple drop down menu like this one here. So when we hover on the services link, we get a sub menu. And then each sub menu link has a different state on hover. We change the background, we change a little bit of the uh, of the padding here, and we show this arrow. But as you can see, everything happens very suddenly. Uh, there is no transition, there is no animation, it's just there, or it isn't. So let's go ahead and fix that. Let's start by first of all, adding a transition to the color of these links, because they go from this uh, lighter gray, or sorry, from this darker gray to a lighter gray. So in here, in exercise number four, let's do the following. We're going to target nav ul a because that's currently our structure. We go nav ul uh, and then a. All we got to do here is say transition property color. And then let me just copy this right at the end of our style sheet. We're going to do the following transition duration. And here I've actually defined a variable called default transition duration and transition timing function is in and out. Now, the reason I'm doing this, the reason I'm separating the properties like so is that I want to apply the same transition duration and timing function to multiple elements. So to keep the code a little bit cleaner, and to not repeat myself, I'm going to add the rest of the elements here, meaning the rest of the elements that uh, share the same duration and timing function. And then for each individual element, I'm going to just uh, specify which property to transition. Okay, so by doing this, we now have a simple uh, transition for the link colors. What about this arrow? This also needs to be transitioned. So if we look in the CSS code, or actually, let me show you in the HTML, each list item that has a sub menu uh, receives a class named has sub menu. And in our CSS, we are actually using an after pseudo element to load up that icon. And we're also setting an opacity of 0.6. Except on hover, right here, we are setting that opacity on the after pseudo element to one. So that's the thing that we have to transition. So back here in our CSS, we're just going to say has sub menu after we're going to transition the property of opacity. And of course, we want the same duration and timing function. So we're going to add that to the list. So now that link changes as a whole. Great. Now let's see about this, uh, the actual sub menu, right? If we look in the code, the sub menu itself is this UL, which we've styled previously in, uh, in CSS with has sub menu UL, you can see it has a position absolute, top left background color, and so on and so forth. And to show it on hover, we're basically setting initially, we're setting it display to none. And then on hover, we're setting its display property to block. So let's go ahead and add a transition to that. But in order to make it work the way we want it, uh, we're going to have to change its properties just a little bit. So let's start with this has sub menu UL. Uh, by default, we're going to change its display to block. So it's always visible. Yeah, uh, we're going to change its opacity to zero. So now it's hidden. But also notice that even though it's hidden, if I hover my mouse where it is, we still get a cursor change, because we can still interact with those links. So to fix that, let's change the visibility to hidden. Okay, so now I can no longer interact with that invisible menu. Now to 
animate it, let's use a transform. Let's move it initially to the left by, let's say, one rem. And when it's opened, we're going to move it back into its original position. So we're going to do the following. We'll say transform, translate x minus one rem, okay? And then let's specify which properties we need to transition. So we're changing the opacity, we're changing the visibility, and we're changing where we're uh, uh, working with transform. Okay, so now to show it, we're going to say has submenu, hover UL. So when we hover on the submenu, we target the UL, and we're going to change its opacity to one. We're going to change its visibility to visible, and we're going to reset the transform. So transform translate x zero. Let's see what, how that's going. So hover. And it's working, but we don't get the transition just yet. Why is that? Because all we specified here was the transition property. We don't have a duration. We don't have an easing. So let's go ahead and add it right here. We're going to say has submenu UL. So now this receives the duration and the timing function. So now, ah, different story, right? Now that's a nice animation, very smooth, very simple. So the animation basically goes from a translate X of minus one rem, which basically means that we're moving the element one rem to the left, and then on hover, when it should be visible, we move it back into its original position. So the effect is that it slides in from the left. And also we are transitioning the opacity of it. So it goes from opacity zero to opacity one when we hover on the parent link. Simple. Now, let's move on to the links inside the submenu. So what exactly is changing here from default to hover? First of all, the color of the link, right? But we already have that covered because we've done it uh, here in the top level. Then it changes the background color, right? It goes from nothing, from transparent to this lighter gray. And then it also changes the padding. Notice that uh, the the hovered link has a, a slightly bigger left padding than the ones below. And of course, uh, we have this icon, which we'll, uh, we'll get to in just a little bit. But let's see about the other properties. We're going to do this has some menu, we're going to target ULA, right? So the anchor tags inside the UL. And uh, all we're going to do here is say transition property, we're going to change the background color and the padding. Of course, we also need to add this right here to get the duration and timing function. So now look at that. The background color is transitioned and the padding is also transitioned. It's a much smoother effect. Now let's fix this icon. How is this applied? Because uh, we just have list items and anchor tags. We don't have an actual icon being displayed here. But if we look at the CSS right here, has submenu UL A, we're using again an after pseudo element and we're loading this icon, this SVG icon. And the way we're uh, displaying it is by default, opacity is set to zero. And then here, we're setting its opacity to one. So in our CSS, we need to do the following. We need to say has submenu UL a after. So we're basically targeting that, uh, that icon. And we're going to say transition property, opacity. And then of course, we're going to get this copy it, paste it in here to give it the duration and timing function. And that should be it. Now, the change in opacity for this purple icon is also animated. 
And with just a few lines of code, you saw how we turned this uh, submenu from just appearing or disappearing into an element that adds some nice motion to our uh, header area. Let's move on with our next practical exercise, number five this time. So we have an image gallery that currently looks like this. So it's basically a list of destinations. And when we hover on each image, we get some information about that particular destination, like how long the trip is going to take, where it is, or what it's called, uh, where it is on the globe. Uh, a little description and the starting price. And of course, we have a little accent icon going on here. Of course, this gallery is perfectly functional. We see all of the images and we have all the information on hover, but it's static, it's boring. So let's add some motion to it. Let's have a look at the code actually first. So there's quite a, a lot of things going on here. Let me walk you through each image or each gallery item. So we're basically using a figure element. And then inside we have an image, the actual image wrapped in an anchor tag because we wanted to lead to somewhere else. And then all of the content that you see, all of the text content, and uh, of course the, uh, the icon here is placed in a fig caption. And that fig caption is further divided into a main section that basically has the first three elements. And then it has a footer. And the footer contains the price and the, uh, the arrow. In terms of the CSS, uh, there's a lot that I've already written here. But the one thing that we're interested in, or the main things that are uh, that we're interested in, are the interactions, right? How are we getting them to show up? So the dark background is actually uh, created by using a linear gradient yeah, on the fake caption. The main and the footer, by default, they have their opacity set to zero. And when we hover, oops, when we hover on the figure, we set their opacity to one. So that's a good starting point. But now let's add some motion and we'll start with this uh, with this background, right? The uh, the dark color overlay. Now, traditionally, you would say, okay, so we want to transition that uh, that background. Let's do this. Let's do figure, uh, fig caption, and we'll set transition property to the background. Uh, maybe a transition duration. Let's say the default that we're using and the timing function, uh, an ease in and out. Save that, refresh, and nothing happens. That's because we cannot transition the background property or the background uh, image property. Let's say this was, I don't know, a background image, and we want to transition the background image, right? It doesn't work because uh, that's currently not supported in CSS. So instead, Let's replicate this uh, color overlay in such a way that uh, it can be animated. And that's with the help of a pseudo element. So let's do the following. Let's uh, comment this bit. And also let's comment this bit. And we're going to say here, not supported. Okay, so now uh, we're actually missing that overlay. Let's create it by using a pseudo element. We're going to say fig caption before. Let's give it a content blank. Let's set position absolute because I want it to span like the entire width of its parent. Uh, let's make sure the fig caption itself. Okay, so it does have a position absolute. So uh, anything that we, any position that we apply to the before will be relative to that fig caption. That's good. So we're going to set inset to zero. This basically makes the pseudo element full width, full height. And then here's the cool part. We're going to say background, and we're actually going to copy this entire thing. So we're essentially applying the same background, but to the uh, to the before pseudo element instead of the uh, fig caption. 
Uh, let's set a Z index of minus one so it sits under all of the other elements. Let's set an opacity to zero so it's hidden by default. And actually, let's see if we can see that. And we cannot see it just yet. And that's because uh, we need to set a Z index of one on the fig caption. So it sits a little in front. Okay, so now we can see the, uh, the, the before pseudo element, the color overlay. So now let's take, uh, let's set its opacity to zero and let's set the transition property to opacity, right? So we're transitioning the opacity. And then at the very end, we're gonna say fig caption before, just like we did in the previous demo, we're gonna set the duration and timing function separately because we're gonna apply those to multiple elements. That color overlay is gone, so we need to show it on hover. So we're gonna say figure on hover, and then we're gonna target fig caption before. And we're simply gonna set an opacity to one. And there we go. That's how you add a simple transition to a color overlay like this. Great, let's move on. What else can we do here? How about we scale up the image? Because the images inside each, um, each figure, let's see if I can find that, uh, yeah. So uh, basically all the images have object fit set to cover. So they're gonna expand, fill up the entire available space, which means we can scale them ourselves and they will still be displayed within the boundaries of their parent. So to do that, we're gonna say figure a IMG transform scale. Let's scale them to 1.2, so 120% or 20% bigger. And then we'll uh, set transition property to transform. And then of course, we need to copy this, add it here, and we can actually just remove that. Figure IMG is more than enough. So now our layout is totally broken. <laughs> Why is that? Because uh, we set the uh, scale, right? We scaled up the images, but we actually forgot to set overflow to hidden on the parent element, which is the figure. So let's just target the figure and set overflow to hidden. Okay, so now the images are scaled up, but they don't show up or we can't see the overflow because they're cut off on their parent element. So now let's actually create the animation. We're gonna say figure on hover AIMG transform scale back to one. So now it looks like this. Pretty cool effect, isn't it? So again, how we're doing this, we're initially scaling up the image by 20% and then on hover, we scale it down back to its original position, back to 100%. And we're just transitioning that transform property, that scale. Nice. Now, let's animate the rest of the elements as well. And we're gonna do this in two parts. We basically have the main, which has these three elements, duration, name, and description. And then we have the footer, which has the price and the, uh, the arrow. So let's set some initial styles for those. We're gonna say figure main. Let's do this, let's uh, apply a transform. Let's do a translate 3D. And translate 3D is um, a good option if you want to force browsers to use, bra uh, to use uh, hardware acceleration. They're gonna use the GPU to render that animation, which in most cases will make the animation a lot smoother as opposed to a regular uh, translate. So translate 3D, this receives this uh, receives three properties, X, Y, Z. We're gonna animate the Y. So we're gonna say minus six rems and zero for the Z axis. And then we'll set transition property to opacity and transform. Because if you remember, uh, figure main and figure footer by default have their opacity set to zero, and then on hover, 
or one or however on the figure element, we set their opacity to one. So we want to animate that opacity as well. And actually, let's uh, move this up just to be a bit neater with our code here. And let's add figure main and figure footer to this list so they both receive the transition duration and timing function. All right, so now we set its initial position, which is minus six rems. So we're moving the main element above. Now let's do the final position or the position on hover. So we're going to say figure hover main transform translate 3D 0, 0, 0. So now on hover, we have a nice transition, a nice animation that goes from top to its original position and also back when we hover out. Okay, so now let's see what we can do with the footer. I want the footer to come in to slide in from the bottom, right? So we get the top to slide in from the top and the bottom to slide in from the bottom. It's kind of a symmetrical thing. So let's start, let's uh, copy this. And I'm going to say figure footer transform translate 3d. This time, by default, we're going to set its initial position six rems to the bottom. Okay, and then transition property is again, opacity and transform. So then here, we can copy this, we can apply it to the footer element as well, because it's essentially the same transform. So now the animation looks like this. One half or actually two thirds of the content slides in from the top, and the other third slides in from the bottom. Nice, right? But I'm actually not happy with the image here with the uh, with the arrow. Let's do something to that as well. Let's have it slide in from the left and also do a bit of rotation, right? So down here, we're going to say figure footer image, because it's only one image in the footer. So we can target it like this, no problem. Uh, we're going to say transform, first of all, translate 3d. And we're going to say, let's say minus three rems should be enough zero zero. And also, we're going to add another transform and you can chain these no problem. Just leave a space and do the other transform. Uh, rotate, let's do 360 degrees. And also let's set the opacity to zero. So now to show it, we're going to say figure on hover footer image, we're going to transform translate 3d, just reset the values and also ro uh, reset the rotate. And we're going to set the opacity to one. Okay. So now it looks something like this. The uh, the image here just, you know, it comes in from uh, from the left. And it we also animate its opacity. But the thing is, we don't actually see this effect very well. Because it's happening kind of at the same time with the other elements. Plus, it's because the icon is contained within the footer of this uh, gallery item, which is also animated, by the time the animation here ends, uh, its animation ends at the same time as the animation for the footer. So how about we add a delay? So the idea is we animate the footer and after the footer has finished animating, then we start animating the actual icon. And to do that, we're going to go back here to the uh, image. And we're going to set a transition delay, meaning how long before the transition starts, and we're going to add exactly the, um, the default transition, the duration of our default transition, because that's what the footer is using, right? So let's see if that works any better. Hover, there we go. So by adding the delay, the footer gets animated. And after the footer is finished animating, then the icon starts its, uh, its transition. Pretty nice. 
so that's yet another example of how you can use simple transitions to add motion to a website. Now, let's turn our attention to practical exercise number six, where we're going to work on this really cool accordion. So this is a fictional weather app that displays the weather forecast for a given city. And each accordion item can be clicked on and it's going to expand to show more information along with some really cool graphics. And all of these graphics are taken from Envato Elements. So if you don't find them in the starter kit, that's why you're going to have to download them yourself. But essentially, on the default state or on the collapsed state, we're displaying day, date, a smaller version of the main graphic, and then day and night temperature. On the expanded version, we add the weather conditions. We move the day and night temperature under that, and we're displaying some additional information, wind speed, humidity, and chance of rain. Now, let me start by saying that this accordion was inspired by this pen from Z dash. Here's a link, uh, you'll also find it uh, linked in the code. So let me show you how this works in terms of CSS. Uh, it actually starts with JavaScript, right? Because when we click each of the uh, accordion items, we're either removing or adding a class of opened. And if we take a look at the uh, CSS here, we can see that the accordion has a display of flex. So this is the parent element. Okay, each accordion item gets a background color and image. And then on uh, the opened one, right, so on the open class, we're basically changing the background size and the flex basis. This is how we're going from the from this size, from the collapsed to the expanded version. This right here is 32 rems in width. So let's see what kind of animations we can add to this to make it a little bit more lively. First of all, let's start with the with each accordion item and let's transition this uh, this change in uh, in width, in background size and in padding because there is also uh, just a minor change in padding here. So down here, we're going to do the following, we're going to say accordion item, and we're going to transition the properties of flex basis, background size, and padding. And of course, we need to add the duration, just like we did in the previous two demos. And I'm going to be using my CSS variable there. And then the timing function Let's do an ease in out, just a simple one. So now you'll see that just with those three lines of code, we added some motion, we added a nice transition to the uh, to the background size, and to the size of the actual card that's being displayed and also to the padding. And now let's add a transition on hover. Let's say that when we hover on one of these items that are not opened, we want to uh, increase the background size, we want to make this image bigger. Okay, so we're going to say accordion item on hover. And we're going to we're going to target the ones that are not opened. And this should actually be a class here. So for the ones that are not opened, we're going to change the background size to 32 rems. And we're going to change the padding block. Padding block basically means padding top and bottom in a, a regular or in a layout with uh, with a default uh, direction. So padding block, let's set that to three rems. So now we get this, right, the background changes. And the padding block, right, that pushes the uh, the content on the top, it pushes it down. And it only works on the stuff that's not opened. Okay, 
Now, let's uh, try and make this uh, this animation a little bit smoother because there are certain elements that are not uh, animating properly. Like, for example, this temperature, right? So when we click on it, it just disappears, right? And when we uh, collapse it, it just shows up. So let's see what we can do about that. First of all, uh, let's target it. So we're going to say accordion item on hover and also not opened. And let's target bottom temp. By default, let's add a transform and we're going to move it down. So translate 3D, 0, minus 1 rem, and 0. So on hover, yeah, we push it up. Uh, I, I think I said we move it down. No, we actually push it up. We say uh, y minus one rem. So we move it up. Now, of course, let's uh, do this bottom temp. Let's add a transition to that. So transition property. Uh, what are we transitioning? The, uh, sorry, transform. Okay. And let's also add the um, uh, duration and timing function. Now let's actually move these down just so they're right at the end so we, we can find them a little bit easier. Okay, so now uh, both of these elements are animated correctly. But now on opened, I want this bottom temp to kind of move down, to fade down. Because what happens is on opened, if we look at the original code, opened bottom temp, it set uh, it has its opacity set to zero. So it basically disappears from there. So let's actually add the opacity here. Let's transition it as well. And we're going to say opened bottom temp. Let's do a transform. Translate 3D, zero, two rem, and zero. And the two rem is just to push it down like so, you know? So pay attention to it here. When we click this, or it's actually better visible here, when we click it, it's going to move down and disappear, like so. It's a very subtle effect, but uh, it's much better than uh, for it to just disappear all of a sudden. Okay, so far, we have a nice transition on hover. And we started to work on these elements for when the um, accordion item is opened or is expanded. But we still have a bit of work to do because we still have the temperature, which needs to be somehow animated and these readings, right? So let's get to that. First of all, let's start with the uh, with the temperature here. And that's positioned in a class of temp. So we're going to say temp, let's transition the opacity and transform. Okay, because by default, we're going to set the transform to translate 3D to zero minus four rems on the Y axis. So it's above and then zero. And then actually, let's do the same for the readings. And this time it's going to be plus four rems. Okay, so the readings are going to be initially positioned further down, the temp further up, and in their original or in their final position, when the card is revealed, they're gonna be at zero, zero. So let's actually add readings here as well to transition those properties as well. And now all we have to do is say opened temp and opened readings, transform, translate 3D, zero, zero, zero. Okay, so now, uh, it's still not happening. That's because we did not add a duration or a timing function. So let's add temp here and readings. Great. Now <laughs> it should work. So click, there we go. So it's a subtle animation, but you can see it, right? The temperature slides from the top, the readings slide from the bottom, uh, the opacity is also animated. 
It's a very subtle effect, but one that really completes this whole picture. And one last thing we, uh, we need to do here, uh, as you can see, in the default state, the date here is shown in like full white color. But on the open state, it's actually a bit more subdued, right? We're actually changing the color here. So just to wrap things up, let's add uh, a transition to that. And let's take a look at the code here. We have uh, UL class date and we have the second list item. So pretty simple in CSS, we're gonna say date list item nth child two transition property color. And then we're gonna take this and add it here to our list. Okay, save. And now that change in color on this element is also transitioned. So in this lesson, we worked on three demos with CSS transitions. And the first thing we learned is that not all CSS properties support transitions, like for example, background. However, there are workarounds, one of which being the use of pseudo elements. We also learned that not all transitions in a page need the same duration. Sometimes using a longer transition among shorter ones can create a very satisfying movement. And finally, we saw that transitions are not limited to hover states. For example, they can be triggered when an element receives a certain class. And by saying what I just said, we can check off yet another member of our dynamic trio. Now, let's do a quick recap. So far in this course, we worked with videos. We added motion with some CSS transitions. And I also made some very stupid, uh, sorry, very clever superhero references. Now, all that's left to do is to talk about CSS animations for the rest of this course. And don't worry, there will be demos as well. Let's start with an introduction. Earlier in this course, we, or I, compared animations with Black Widow. And that's not because I don't like Hawkeye. He's a cool dude, but kind of a one-trick pony. Black Widow, on the other hand, is much more versatile. Therefore, she received the honor of being compared to CSS animations. Not that she would ever care about that. Regardless, the point I'm trying to make is that CSS animations are much more versatile than transitions. So in the next couple of minutes, we'll define a CSS animation, we'll create a simple one, and we'll finally explore the differences between CSS animations and CSS transitions. Uh, let's begin. A CSS animation is a way to make elements gradually change their appearance or position over time. It's done by defining keyframes, which are the in-between states of this change. The animation is then created by smoothly transitioning between these keyframes. Now, there are two parts to creating CSS animations. First, you need to define the keyframes, essentially describing the animation step by step. Then, number two, you apply that animation to the elements that you want. To create the keyframes, you type at keyframes, followed by a name of your choosing. Then, inside curly braces, you describe the steps. The easiest way is by using the from and to keywords. Then, inside each step, you can add as many CSS declarations as you want. In this example, I'm creating an animation called move right, which has two steps. In step one, I'm setting a transform property to translate X zero. In step two, the translate X is set to 100 pixel. This animation will essentially move an element 100 pixels to the right. Now that you have keyframes, therefore you described the animation, you need to apply it to whatever elements you want. And to do that, there are several animation-related properties, such as animation name, animation duration, 
animation delay, and so on. But in most cases, you'll be using a shorthand notation. And the recommended syntax goes like this. The proper name is animation and is followed by a list of values for duration, easing function, delay, iteration count, direction, fill mode, play state, and name. In this example, we're applying the move right animation we created earlier to the elements with the class of box. The duration is set to three seconds. It uses ease in out as the easing function. It has a one second delay and it runs twice. Notice how the code in this example did not use every animation related property. And that's because you don't have to. At a minimum, you need to specify an animation name and an animation duration. The rest can be used as needed. So now let's go to practical exercise number seven, where we have a simple image. This is an SVG actually, that I got from Novato Elements. Now let's create a simple animation. Let's, uh, let's make this into a page loader. And to keep it simple, let's make it breathe, meaning from its initial size, it grows a little and then it shrinks back. So let's see how we can achieve that with CSS animations. So if you remember, what was the first step to creating animations? Defining keyframes, right? Describing the actual animation. So we're going to say keyframes. We're going to call this breathe. And then inside, we're going to say from transform scale one to transform scale 1.2. So now we described the animation. Let's apply it. Let's target loading screen, which is our div basically, or actually let's apply it to the loader icon because we have an ID set for that. So loader icon, let's set the duration. So we'll set animation, three seconds for duration, uh, easing, we can put something like ease in out. How many times do we want it to repeat? Let's say infinite. So it goes on and on and on. And then the name of the animation, breathe, save, refresh. Nice. So the animation makes this uh, SVG element grow in size over three seconds from scale 100 to 120%. But there is a weird effect after the animation ends, it kind of goes back to its original position. And it's not exactly a breathing effect, right? Because the scale down, basically, so the scale from 120 to 100% should also be animated. So the way we can do that is by adding alternate. And let's uh, reapply that. So alternate basically solves our problem. But what exactly does it do? Well, the animation, if you remember from the slides I showed you, uh, the animation has a direction. So it can go forward or it can go in reverse. By default, the animation goes forward. So from to. But if we set the direction to reverse, let's actually do that right now. Reverse. It goes from scale up to scale down. So it goes from 120% to 100% in size. Now, alternate, this is the animation mode, alternate basically does one iteration of the animation in forwards and the other in reverse. Okay, so uh, this one is in forwards and when it reaches the end, Alternate does the other iteration in reverse, therefore giving us the breathe effect that uh, we're after. Now, let me preemptively answer this question. Does the order of the values matter? Meaning, does the code on the left do the same thing as the code on the right? Uh, the answer is no. Each of those two code snippets produces a slightly different result. And the answer is yes, the order does matter. 
You see, the order of time values is important. So the first one that can be parsed as a time value is assigned to the animation duration. And the second one is assigned to the animation delay. So the animation on the left will have a duration of three seconds and a delay of one second, while the one on the right will have a duration of one second and a delay of three seconds. So keep that in mind. Also, the animation name should be used last. It's considered best practice, and the reason for that is very simple. If a value can be used for something other than the animation name, it's applied to that property first. So just to be consistent and make your code easier to read and uh, avoid potential future issues, just follow the simple rule and uh, use the animation name last. Now, previously in the course, I said that animations allow us to create much more complex movement. And that's true. But what exactly is that? What is complex movement? And how are animations different than transitions? Well, let's uh, consider keyframes to begin with. An animation is basically a series of keyframes, of steps, and you can have any number of those. Transitions can only have two steps, start and end, nothing in between. The second difference is that animations support looping, meaning it can be run once, twice, 10 times, or continuously. Transitions, on the other hand, run just once. The third major difference is direction. You see, transitions have a fixed direction, meaning they go one way. Animations can go forward, in reverse, and they can even alternate between the two. Finally, we have play state. An animation can be paused. Transitions cannot. Once a transition starts, it runs to the end. But an animation can be paused or resumed at any point. So they're both very useful techniques, but they should be used appropriately. Animations for uh, complex movement that has more than two steps, that um, I, you know is repeatable, that is also pausable. Is that a word? Pausable? That can be paused, right? And the transitions for simple changes between two states. So, in this lesson, we learned that CSS animations gradually change elements by smoothly transitioning between the find keyframes. To create keyframes, use at keyframes, followed by a chosen name. Then, inside curly braces, describe the animation steps. You can use from and to for the easiest setup. You can apply animations using properties like animation name, animation duration, and animation delay. You can also use a shorthand animation property with values for duration, easing, delay, iteration count, direction, fill mode, play state, and name. At a minimum, you need to specify the animation name and duration. The rest can be added as needed. Adding alternate as the direction causes the animation to alternate between forward and reverse at the end of each iteration, creating a back and forth effect. If you're using the shorthand notation, the order of time values is important. The first one is assigned to animation duration and the second to animation delay. Finally, remember that animations consist of multiple keyframes and support looping, direction changes, and play pause. Transitions only have two steps, start and end, and uh, run once with a fixed direction. And those are the basics of CSS animations. Don't worry, we'll also cover the more advanced stuff as the course goes on, and we'll explore the various use cases for these. Uh, let's start with some loading animations. Loading animations are very common in user interfaces because they're a great way of informing users that something is happening, occasionally showing the progress of that something. 
Take this uh, spinner animation, for example. It's very simple, yet very straightforward, because when you see it, you immediately think, okay, so there's something going on in the background. Something's cooking up. And this has a good impact on UX, on the user experience, because it gives users uh, confidence and reassurance. Now, for example, if I uh, fill in a form and I submit my data, uh, and uh, that data processing or submission, you know, takes a while, I would like to get some sort of feedback to let me know what's going on if my uh, data has been received or is processing and uh, a loading animation is uh, perfect for that kind of thing. And these can be of any shape or size, they don't need to be a spinning circle. So they can look like this, or like this, or like this. And by the way, if you go to Envato Elements and you search for loading, you'll find tons of cool stuff from video templates to standalone graphics just like these. Ultimately, designers can choose to design these loading animations uh, to be, you know, in style with the overall website concept or the even the brand. So let me show you some real world examples. The first one is Dog Studio, and if we do a quick refresh, you'll see this nice animation of the dog running. Let's see that again. Really nice. It's, of course, in line with the uh, rest of the website concept, you know, having the dog and stuff, uh, but also, the, you know, the colors match. We, we, uh, we get that kind of orange uh, there, and we also have this, these orange accents here. So, fantastic. Uh, another example comes from the Marie Weber website, where we can see this loading animation here, really nice. Uh, this is actually a part of the logo from Marie Weber. See that again? So yeah, it's kind of a drawing animation of the, of the logo. Uh, loading animations can also be displayed like this, like a loading bar, actually. And uh, here we can also see the percentage really nice. Uh, we get uh, a similar effect here on the Moxion website. Again, we have a loading bar and then the uh, content just uh, animates in. And finally, let's have a look at the sketch website. And if we scroll a little bit further down to the uh, to the features here, we can see that we have some loading animations right here. So the idea is when a certain feature is being um, displayed, or rather the uh, the image for that feature is being displayed. Uh, this gets highlighted and we get a loading animation telling us how long that feature will remain uh, highlighted. Now the loading animations I just showed you are used almost exclusively as a placeholder uh, until the page fully loads. And they are also known as site preloaders. But not all loading animations uh, should be used like that. And let me give you an example. If we go to MTB Riders and we uh, just select any product, we click Add to Cart, watch what happens inside the button. Saw that? It was pretty fast, but let's do it again. Yeah, we got a brief animation of some dots running telling us that, okay, you clicked add to cart, we're working on it. And then at the end, uh, I also got this nice message that says, okay, we added the item to your cart. So that's considered as, you know, another loading animation, but it's not used as a site preloader. Instead, it's used in another part of the UI. Actually, just like uh, this one from, uh, from Sketch. It, uh, basically achieves a similar uh, result. Now, to create these cool loading animations, uh, we have two options. Either we create them ourselves, which we'll do in just a bit, or we get them from somewhere else, right? Searching Google for CSS Spinner will give us plenty of results to choose from. I recommend SpinKit by Tobias Allen. Uh, once you find a loader you like, you simply copy the HTML, copy the CSS, and that's it.
Now, apart from your typical CSS loaders, you can also use Lottie animations. And Lottie is a versatile animation file format. It's open source, lightweight, high quality, and infinitely scalable. It can easily incorporate Lottie animations into your projects, and they can be manipulated in real time. Fun fact, Lottie animations are super popular among the top 500 uh, apps in the App Store, and um, they're super popular or they're heavily used by uh, some big names like Apple, Google, Adobe, uh, Disney, Netflix, and many more. If you're on the hunt for Lottie animations, your first stop should be the official website at lottiefiles.com. Here you can simply search for something like Loader and check out all the cool animations created by the community. You'll find both freebies and premium picks. And when you find one you like, just click on it to see how you can use it in your project. And with an active subscription, you can download tons of Lottie files from Innovato Elements. For example, here are some really cool animated technology icons. There is a lot to talk about when it comes to Lottie animations. That's probably a, a separate course on itself. So for now, let's focus on this course and this lesson, which is about loading animations. And let's get practical. Let's create some of these animations ourselves. Time for practical exercise number eight. And for this, we're going to be creating a site preloader. And we'll use uh, one of our older uh, demos, this uh, nice image gallery here. And the reason why we would need such a site preloader is that there are a lot of images here and it might take a while to download, especially if we're on a slow connection. So it's a good idea to show some kind of loading indicator uh, while the page is loading in the background. So if we go to uh, the network here and we do like, uh, let, let's do something like a slow 3G uh, simulation and we'll disable the cache. Uh, you can see that the images, once we uh, refresh, right, it's going to take a while to download. And so the end user doesn't necessarily need to see this, doesn't need to wait for the images to, uh, uh, to load. But instead, we're going to show a nice loading animation. And as you can see, it still uh, takes quite a while because I used uh, large images here on purpose. And it's just going to keep going. All right. So let's close this for now and uh, start working on our site preloader. And we're going to start with the HTML. So we're in exercise eight here. And the way I have the setup is uh, I have all of the page content uh, placed in a section that has an ID of page content, right? We have the header here, the gallery, and there's nothing else on the page uh, apart from that. So let's actually create our loader container here, and we're gonna use some CSS to style that accordingly. So I'm gonna say uh, div class uh, loader container, and inside I'm gonna create another div with a class of a loader. Now we're not gonna use a pre-made loader, we're gonna create it ourselves. It's super easy to do from CSS. So right now we just have two empty divs. Now let's go in here in our CSS, and we're going to say the following. Let's start with the loader container first. So what I want to do here is basically have this div fill up the entire page, and we're going to give it a background color, and uh, we're going to place it above everything else on the page. Okay, so the way to do that very easily, we're going to uh, set a position to fixed. Uh, we'll set inset zero so it fills up the entire viewport. Uh, we're going to set a Z index of 999 so it's really high. Uh, and then let's set a background color and I'm going to use 0C0603. And then I want the actual loader to be placed in the middle of, uh, of the page basically. So I'm going to use grid for that because I can do place content center and that's gonna center everything nicely without me having to do anything. So right now, as you can see, 
I have this black screen almost. It's not exactly black, but it's a, it's a very dark color screen and it covers absolutely everything. Now, let's work on the actual loader, the, uh, the loading animation. So let's target the loader class, oops. And let's do this. Let's do with four rams. And just so you know, we're gonna do like a spinning circle. Uh, I'm gonna do a height of four rams. And let's do the following border. We're gonna do 0.4 rems, solid, and let's give it a color of F2 7541. Okay, so now we basically have, let me zoom in here, we basically have a box with a border, right? So now what I'm gonna do is say this, border left color, transparent, and that's gonna get rid of the left border. I'm gonna do the same for the right border, so it looks like this. And now I'm gonna say border radius 50% to turn it into a circle. Pretty cool, huh? So now let's animate this. We're gonna rotate it basically, okay? So let's create an animation. Let's call it spinner. And let's do this from transform rotate zero degrees and scale one. We're gonna say two, transform, rotate 360 degrees or one turn. And let's also scale it up a bit, 1.2. So now let's apply that animation. We're gonna say animation. Let's do like 0.8 seconds, ease as an easing uh, infinite to just go on and on and on forever and the animation name. And it looks like that. Pretty cool, except uh, we get that glitch uh, when the animation ends. Uh, because we have a scale, it just, uh, it doesn't go back to its original position. So let's add an alternate here. So it looks like this. Nice. And by the way, we can totally comment this bit and the animation will still work. Why is that? Because these are the default values, right? It's it's a given that the browser will start at rotate zero and scale one. So we can actually just remove this entirely and have the two step. The reason I, uh, even in the, the previous lesson, I showed you the from and to is that so you understand the starting position and the end position, but uh, this is uh, actually optional. The animation will still work just fine. And now let's uh, only display this spinning animation while the page is loading. After it's finished loading, we're gonna hide the whole thing. So how do we do that? Well, we need to write some JavaScript. So let's go right at the end of our uh, page here. And we're gonna start by defining some constants here. First of all, we're gonna get the loader container and we'll do a, a query selector for loader container. And we'll do another constant for the page content, right? And that's also a query selector for the uh, page content. If you remember, we have that, uh, that section defined right there. So this is super easy to do. We can say window add event listener, load, and then we're gonna pass in like an anonymous function. And we're gonna say loader container class list add hidden, and then page content class list add visible. Super simple. So basically, when the window finishes loading all of its assets, it's gonna add the hidden class to the dark loader container and the visible class to the page content. So now uh, we basically have to go back to our CSS and create those classes. So we're gonna start with the loader container with the class of hidden. Uh, that's basically gonna say opacity zero, visibility hidden. And then the page content by default, it's gonna have opacity zero. And let's actually do like a like a simple uh, transform effect. Uh, we're gonna say transform translate 3D 
Let's do zero minus one RAM. So we push it up a little bit. And then page content uh, with the class of visible, we do what? We say opacity one, and we reset the transform like so. So let's see if that works. Uh, let's open up a, a console here to see if we have any errors, and we do not. And let's go to network. Let's uh, simulate that, uh, that same page reload. Okay, so we're showing the, uh, the loader until the page finishes downloading basically all of its assets, which uh, is going to take a while, apparently. And there we go. Once it finished downloading, it took 25 seconds. It hid the uh, loader and it showed it and it, uh, sorry, it showed us our page. Now, of course, that just suddenly appeared because we didn't add any kind of transitions. So let's go to the loader container and we're going to transition here the opacity, opacity, let's do like 0.4 seconds, ease in out. And also the visibility, because we're also animating that one, easing it out. And uh, that's for the loader container. Uh, we also need to apply a transition to the page content right here. Okay. So we'll say transition uh, for what the opacity. Let's do 0.6 seconds this time. So a little bit bigger, uh, ease in and out. And we're also transforming, right? So transform, 0.6 seconds, ease and out. So the page content between it being in its default state and being visible, yeah, we change the opacity and we change the transform. So that's, uh, those are the two properties we're transitioning. So now uh, let's go back here and We'll do basically the same test. And uh, last time it took about 25 seconds. So it's probably going to take exactly the same this time because we disabled the cache and we're using the same uh, 3G, fast 3G preset. But yeah, as soon as that's, that's finished, uh, uh, we get a nice transition. The, uh, the page content kind of slid, slid slided, I think slided, uh, the page content kind of slided from the top, uh, while also animating its opacity. So pretty cool effect. Uh, very simple to do. And um, you saw how easy it is just to create uh, a loader with a couple of lines of CSS. This uh, first demo was super simple. So you can uh, understand the whole process. But as you saw from the real world examples I showed you earlier, Loading animations can be way more complex. So time for practical exercise number nine. So when I was um, working on the demos for this course, I was wondering what I should do for a loading animation. And I remember this, uh, this website that I showed you previously in this course, it's uh, Marie Weber. And if you remember, there is like a hand drawn animation of the logo as a loader, which you can see right here. So that's pretty cool. And I thought, okay, so I want to do something like that. But what if I want to do it with text? And thankfully, if we're doing this using SVG, there's actually a pretty cool technique uh, we can apply uh, by using something called uh, stroke dash offset and stroke dash array. Those are properties which can be animated. So uh, let me show you uh, how we can do something like that. So uh, we're going to start here in exercise nine. And we're going to create our SVG. And don't worry, it's, uh, it's nothing uh, super complicated. And let's uh, give it a view box. And we're going to say zero zero, uh, we're going to make this a text 400 by 160. And inside the SVG, we're basically going to have two uh, text elements. And the first text is going to say graphics. This is just uh, a random uh, company name, I guess. And this is going to be our logo, basically. And um, 
we're going to do the following. I'm going to set an x value of 50%. Uh, same for y, 50%. And this is just going to place the text. Uh, it's going to give the text coordinates, basically. And then I'm going to say dy. I'm going to set that to 0.32 uh, rems. And the dy is basically an attribute that indicates, um, let's call it a shift along the y axis. So we're basically just uh, shifting it up or down. And I'm doing this, this just for alignment purposes. Don't worry about this too much at this point. Uh, also, I'm going to set text anchor middle. That's going to serve as a reference for the coordinates. And then I'm going to give this a class of text body. Great. Now, uh, I'm actually going to copy this. And I'm going to add a dot in here. So if we uh, check this out. Yeah, we can't actually see anything because uh, we need to uh, to set some CSS for it. So uh, let's go ahead and do that right now. I'm going to say SVG, uh, SVG text, actually. And let's do the text body first. Let's add a stroke. And I'm going to use a variable here called loader text color. And let's actually give this a font size, let's say five rems. And let's give it a stroke width of two. So we can actually see something. Well, we can't see it yet. Uh, let's also give the SVG a size, let's say with like 20 rems. So now we can start actually seeing stuff. And let's make it bolder, right? So I'm using Poppins here as a font. And now let's position this, uh, this dot like right here at the end. So uh, or I'm actually going to do this right here, I'm going to say dx, which is, uh, you know, the shift on the y axis, I'm going to set that to like two rems. And actually, actually, let's use m's here instead of rems. Okay, there we go. Because I want the these distances to be relative to the font size of the actual uh, uh, graphic. So let's increase this a little bit. Okay, so for now, that looks just fine. Let me actually make this a little bit bigger. All right. So coming back to the CSS. Uh, I would like the letters here to be just a little bit closer together. So let's actually add a letter spacing of minus six pixels. So something like that. And now let's create the animations, right? So keyframes. Let's call this animate stroke. And we're going to add this to the text body, right? So I'm going to say animation, let's uh, run this over four seconds, infinite, uh, alternate, so it goes in both directions, and animate stroke. Okay. So here's how we're going to create this animation. Basically, I want this SVG text to be almost drawn. You know, I want the outline to be drawn step by step. So let's start with this. Instead of uh, from and to, we can actually use percentages, I can say 0%. And that's the start, we're going to fill this transparent, or we're going to set the filter transparent, I'm going to set the stroke to the loader text color. And now I'm going to say stroke with three. So this is what we got so far. And then the two properties that are going to make this happen are stroke dash offset, I'm going to set this at 25%. And then stroke dash array zero and 32%. Now, let me quickly explain these two properties, stroke dash, uh, dash array, let's start with this one. So this is a, an attribute that defines the pattern of dashes and gaps used to create the outline of our text. Okay, so for example, let's, uh, let's hide this animation for now. If I were to set the stroke dash array on the text body, let's do the, um, the dashes, let's say 100 pixels. Okay. And let's actually do 10 pixels, I think it's going to be easier to illustrate like that. So if I do 10 pixels here, it means the dashes are 10 pixels in width. And in between the dashes, we have a 32% gap, that's 32% of uh, the total width. 
but I can change this to like 20 pixels. Okay, so now I'm going to have a 10 pixel uh, dash and a 20 pixel gap. And that's just going to keep going along uh, the entire width of the, um, of the stroke, basically. So that's what uh, these two attributes are doing. Now, in my case, I'm setting initially the uh, dash array to zero and 32%, meaning zero, uh, I don't have any dashes. And 32% for the gaps, well, that's just the, uh, the width of the gaps. Now, uh, stroke dash offset, it basically means the starting point of the dashes. That's what it's defining. And right now we're setting the, um, or actually we're offsetting the dashes by 25% of the total path length. So if I were displaying any kind of dashes, they would start a quarter of the way in. Now at 50%, I'll do this. I'll maintain the fill to transparent, and this is important for later, as you'll see. Uh, the stroke as well, I'm going to maintain it at loader text color, and stroke width is still a 3. So I basically didn't change anything. And I'm doing this on purpose because the actual change will be at 80%. And here, I'm going to do this, fill. I'm going to change the fill to the loader text color. I'm going to change the stroke to transparent. I'm going to change the stroke width to zero. And I'm going to change the dash offset to minus 25% and the dash array to 32% and zero. So let me show you what, how that works. It works something like this. But of course, we we have a bit of a, an issue here where the, um, the fill just kind of blinks twice, as you'll see. So it fills up and then back and then back. And the reason for that is we need to specify what happens at 100% as well. And that's going to be exactly the same thing at 100%. So now... This is the end result. Pretty cool, huh? So the way this works, I'm starting at 0% by setting these defaults. So the fill of the text, transparent. The stroke is this loader text color, which is the white, basically. And then stroke width, 3. And then I'm starting with the dash offset of 25% and the dash array of 32%. And the end point, which is 80% and 100%, I'm basically changing the fill from transparent to the white. I'm changing the stroke from the white to transparent. I'm changing the stroke width to 0. And these two properties are what makes uh, everything work. I'm changing the dash offset to minus 25%. So the ending offset of the stroke is in a different position than what we started with. And that's going to be animated. That's going to create uh, the whole animation, basically. And then the dash array, I'm setting it from 0 for the length of the dashes to 32% length of dashes. And from a 32% gap to zero gap. And that's basically going to uh, create this full outline shape. And I can actually make this a lot longer so you can see how everything works. As the animation uh, is closing in on the 100%, yeah, the gaps in the stroke start slowly disappearing and in the end the stroke disappears altogether while the text fills up and when it goes in reverse you'll see that the uh, the stroke or the dashes get smaller and smaller until they disappear completely so 
So I hope that makes sense. This is a, a really nice effect. Uh, and by the way, I got uh, inspiration uh, for this by a code pen by this chap right here. So that's the animation for uh, the actual text, but we still have this dot here. So how about we animate that as well? And the dot is going to be quite simple. So let's create a keyframe for it. And we're going to call it animate dot. And for the dot, it's quite simple. I want 0% and 60% to have the opacity of 0, and then 100% opacity of 1. And if you're confused as to why I'm using these two uh, different stops, it basically means that I want the opacity of 0 to be applied both at the beginning, but also at the 60% point. So by doing this, I'm basically saying, okay, just animate the opacity between 60% and 100%. If I were to do just this, it would animate the opacity between 0 and 100%. And that's going to be a longer animation. But if I'm doing this, it's going to be a shorter animation, because it's the animation itself will only happen when we're already past 60% of the duration of the animation. I hope that makes sense. So let's actually uh, go and target that SVG text with a class of dot. Uh, let's actually fill that with the dot color. And let's give it a stroke. It's also going to be the dot color. And for animation, we'll again add four seconds, infinite, alternate, animate dot. So now the animation looks something like this. You can see the dot there on the left is also animated. And in the end, it's nicely displayed. But let's actually change this back to four seconds. Cool. And that's how you create a loading animation based on text, based on SVG text, to be exact. And that was another example of loading animations, a bit more complex this time, but just like the first one, it still served as a site preloader. But as I showed you previously, not all loading animations should be used for that, they can be used in other parts of the UI as I'll demonstrate in practical exercise number 10. And for exercise 10, we have this uh, very simple login form, where we can fill in our name, our password, and then we can click login. But just in case the login action takes a bit of time, I want to add some sort of indicator inside this button to let the user know that, okay, we've got the, uh, the data you filled in, and we're executing the login process. It, it might take a while. So I want to display some kind of loader in this button while this is taking place. Uh, but of course, I don't have anything running in the back end that allows me to simulate a login action. So we're going to use JavaScript, just to add a bit of a timeout that will give us the option to show that loader. So uh, let's go back uh, into our page here. You can see that I've uh, declared some constants here for the submit button and the submit button text. And what I want to do is on uh, is when we click the button, uh, I'm going to do, uh, first of all, event prevent default, and that's gonna just prevent the default submit action of the button. And then I'm gonna add the uh, loading class. So I'm gonna say submit button class list, add loading. And then finally, I'm gonna use the set timeout function in JavaScript to set a timeout of four seconds before I execute the following, we're gonna remove the loading class. So we're going to say submit button class list, remove loading, and we're going to add the class of success. 
So submit button, class list add, success. And finally, we're going to change uh, the button text. So we're going to say submit button, uh, submit button text, yes, dot inner HTML is going to be equal to login successful. Awesome. So let's see how this works. Let's uh, also do a, a quick inspect here. Notice the button doesn't have any kind of class applied to it. But when I click it, it applies the class of loading. And after four seconds, yeah, it changes the button text and it applies the class of success. So from a JavaScript point of view, that's all we need to do. The rest is now going to be controlled from CSS. So let's actually add, now let's create the uh, the loading animation. We're going to start in HTML where I'm just going to define three divs because I want to do like a like a dot animation with three dots that are uh, animated individually. So I'm just going to create three divs, three empty divs inside my button. And of course, this doesn't do anything uh, visually, because we need to apply some CSS. So in terms of CSS, actually, let's wrap this in a div. And let's give this a class of button loader. That's going to make it easier for us to style. So in here, we're going to say button loader. Uh, let's use flexbox, as I said, display flex, and let's set a gap of 0.25 rems. Okay, great. Then let's target each div. So we're going to say width, let's do 0.8 rems, height, same thing, we're basically making them into circles. Let's make them white, let's make them round. And let's see what we got. Okay, cool. So now let's create the animation. We're going to say keyframes, let's call the animation scale up. So for scale up, I basically want to use scale zero as a default. And that's gonna like shrink it all the way down, and then scale one, uh, somewhere in the middle. So what I can do is say 0%, 80%, and 100%, I want to transform scale zero, and then at, uh, let's say 40%, transform scale one. So now if we add this animation to the button, let's say 1.2 seconds, it goes on and on and on, ease and out, and scale up. It looks something like this. So the dot basically is at scale zero. So it's basically invisible at 0%, 80%, and 100%. And it only scales up to one around the middle point. And that gives us this nice effect. If I were to remove these, it would look something like this, which is not what we want. So by doing this, we're saying that, okay, I want you to animate between scale zero and scale one. Yeah, right, that's my animation. So I want this animation to take place between 0% and 40%. Then between 40% and 80%, I want you to animate it the other way around from scale one to scale zero. And then the end point is 100%. I could also do this. Right, and it's still going to work. But the animation will just take a tiny bit longer. So it's really up to you uh, how you want to do this. But while the animation works, we can actually stagger the animation for each of these dots by adding a delay. So well, we can do this, we can say button loader div and child one, and I can say animation delay, let's say minus 0 0.32 seconds. And then for the second one, I can set an animation delay to let's say half that. So now the animation is the same for each of these dots, but they're staggered. The nth child one starts with a bigger animation delay and child two starts with a smaller animation delay. So that gives the illusion that they're kind of um, 
using a sort of timeline uh, to be animated, one after the other, which is cool. So the animation here is actually complete, but it's uh, it's always present and it's in the wrong position. So let's go ahead and fix that. I'm going to target the button and I'm going to set a display to flex and I'm going to align everything to the center. So justify content, align items, so center on both axes. So it currently looks like this. And I'm also going to give this button a minimum height of three and a half rems, because we're going to start hiding certain elements. And I don't want the button to uh, suddenly change its height uh, when that happens. So I'm setting a minimum height. So now by default, button loader, I'm going to set this display to none. So we hide it. But then when the button has the loading class applied to it, I'm going to target the button text and hide it. Okay, so and the text disappears. But now let's bring back the loader, right? So button loading, we're going to change this back to display flex. So now when we click the button, yeah, the uh, animation shows up for four seconds, and then login successful. Let's also style that a success class. So button with the class of success, uh, we're just going to change the background color really uh, to be var. And I have a contextual uh, success color here. So it looks something like this. And of course, if we want, we can target the loading class and we can say cursor weight. That's going to change the cursor like this. And that's how you can add a different kind of loading animation to a UI element with a bit of JavaScript and some CSS. So in this lesson, we explored loading animations. And these have the task of keeping users informed and sometimes showing the progress of a certain action. Most of the time, these animations will be used as website preloaders. However, they can be used in other parts of the UI, like for example, in a button. You can easily create simple spinners by making certain borders transparent and then using a rotate or scale transform. To display loading animation while a page is loading, add an event listener for the load event in JavaScript. Once that kicks in, hide your loader and display the page content. To create an animated SVG text, consider using the stroke dash array and stroke dash offset properties. The first one defines the pattern of dashes and gaps, while the second one defines the offset of the starting point for the dashes. When creating a loading animation that has multiple elements, consider adding a different animation delay to each element for a unique movement pattern. All right, so with the loading animations done, it's time to move on and uh, talk about animating illustrations and icons. Now, some people would say that animated illustrations or icons are just eye candy. But I disagree. I think that uh, they can serve a practical purpose. And if done right, these animations can actually enhance the user experience in a number of ways. First, engagement. A good animation will catch the user's eye, often making them uh, more willing to stay and explore. Let's look at stripe.com. When we get to the section called unified platform, we immediately get drawn to this content because it moves, it changes. Even if we were to just randomly scroll down, the animations here will definitely catch our attention. Same thing happens further down the page. The spinning globe animation looks super interesting. So most of us will stop to look at it and even scan the text content on the left. Here's another great example from feedly.com. You scroll down and you're immediately drawn to this robot looking character that seems to be sorting stuff. 
and you're like, oh, okay, this is interesting. What's his story? And then you explore and read the text and discover that it's about this AI filtering feature. But if it were a static image, you'd likely skim past it without pausing to read the accompanying text. Animations can also be used to guide a user through a process or uh, to draw the focus to specific key elements. Let's look at Embassy IO, where uh, they're using some animated handwritten text to focus the attention to certain links. The animation combined with the arrows definitely gets the job done. Animated icons and illustrations can uh, also improve or enhance the user experience by providing instant feedback to certain actions. If we go on Twitter or X, as it's called nowadays, uh, clicking the like button triggers an animation, instantly giving us feedback and confirming our action was successful. Another great example is a menu icon. For instance, at Doc Studio, hovering over the menu icon activates a subtle animation, signaling it's clickable. Clicking it then changes the hamburger to a close icon, confirming the action. Finally, let's not forget about entertainment, because let's face it, uh, a well-animated icon or illustration can make a static page feel less boring and more entertaining. And I think the examples I showed you so far have proved just that. Now, uh, remember, moderation is key when dealing with animations, because uh, using too many animations uh, can be distracting and even annoying. After all, we don't want our websites to look like they've had too much coffee right? All right, so let's dive into practical exercise number 11, where we'll create a simple animated icon. And just as a quick reminder, if you want to follow along, you can download the starter kit from the uh, video description. And another reminder is that the starter kit might contain different images than the ones you see me use. Uh, the ones I'm using in this demo are from Envato Elements and uh, because they're licensed there I cannot redistribute them uh, like separately I cannot give them to you in a star kit so if you want the exact same assets that I'm using uh, you're gonna have to download them yourself from uh, Envato Elements with that said let's go for exercise 11, let's revisit one of our older demos. This is uh, the one where we used video as a background. And if you remember from that original demo, we had a, an icon here. We had a like a mouse icon. So I want to add that again, but I want to make it animated. I want uh, to have the outline of a mouse and then have a little dot inside that just scrolls up and down just to signal that, hey, scroll down to find more. Now, we're going to be using Lottie files uh, for this. And uh, this is the only lesson I'm going to be using Lottie files in, because I want the rest to be a little bit more focused on, uh, you know, using JavaScript and CSS to create the, uh, the animations. But I couldn't just pass the opportunity to show you how to work with Lottie files. So here we go. Now I went to uh, LottieFiles.com and I searched for a mouse scrolling icon. You'll find a link to this. And I found this bit. Okay. And once you find it, you know, you can uh, add it to one of your projects. You, you have to create an account, which is free. Uh, but once you have it, uh, you can open it in this editor, you can see a preview of it, you can uh, even, uh, you know, show it on a different transparent grid, you can change the background color. And you can also, uh, you know, change the color palette. If you so desire, you can uh, view the different segments of the animation. And finally, the part that we're interested in is handoff and embed. So you can go in here, you can enable the asset 
link, which allows the animation to be used on, you know, web websites, app, whatever. And you would choose then uh, Lottie JSON or optimized. It really depends on uh, whether or not you want to save some file size. And then you get here to the embed HTML. So all you got to do is you can copy this, you go back to your code and actually open exercise 11 there. And once you copy that, you're going to go right down here to the end of your page and you're going to paste that in. Now this pastes uh, two, two things, basically two scripts. One loads dot Lottie. Uh, it actually loads the .lottie player library. And then it creates an HTML element called .lottie player, where it specifies the SRC, the address of the animation. And uh, you can also use it to uh, change some of its properties here, like the background, the speed it runs, whether or not you want it to loop or to autoplay and stuff like that. So all you got to do is save and then you can come back here and you see the animation is loaded, it's running, except it's a little bit too big. So all I'm going to do is change the width and height here from 300 to 80 pixels. And that should be it. So now you have a simple loading animation directly running in your uh, in your page. It was what, three kilobytes? Let's see, uh, where was it? 3.1 kilobytes. You can go to 2.6 if you're using the optimized JSON. Or, you know, you, you have um, some more options. This is the JSON route. Uh, you can also get the dot Lottie. You have a lot of different uh, options to, to embed this. You can integrate it uh, with even with Webflow, with Wix, WordPress, Elementor, and a whole bunch of, uh, of other things. So Lottie animations, super simple to use. They're highly or super, super popular. And there are plenty of, uh, of sources for you to use them. As I said, this is the only uh, place we're going to use it just to show you how it's done and uh, how easy it is. Now, what if you can't find the perfect animation? What if you're browsing, you know, Lottie files and other stuff and you just can't find the one that uh, that tickles your fancy, so to speak. Well, you have to create it yourself. So let me show you how you can do that in practical exercise number 12. So this is what we have in practical exercise number 12, uh, a simple header and a simple hero image. And the one thing that we're missing is a menu icon right here on the left side, that's going to toggle an animated menu. So let's actually create that ourselves. Let's create a menu icon, a hamburger menu icon that turns into an X when it's clicked. So let's start with the HTML. And we're going to go all the way down here in the header. And we're going to create a button with a class of button and an ID of menu button. And inside, all I'm going to do is create three spans. That's it. We're going to use these spans for the uh, lines of the hamburger icon. So then let's start writing some CSS. I'm going to say menu button. Let's uh, use Flexbox. So display flex and let's uh, set it as column from so from top to bottom. Let's set a gap of 3.5 pixels. Let's set a width of 2.5 rems, a height of 2.5 rems. And let's align the items to the center and also uh, justify uh, the content to the center. And then let's start styling our span elements, our lines, basically, right? So I'm going to set the width to 25 pixels. I'm going to set the height of each line to 2.5 pixels. Background color, I have some uh, variables defined here. And there we go. Let me actually make this a lot bigger so we can see what we're doing. Okay, 
just disregard the rest of the layout. Let's just focus on the uh, on the icon. Uh, let's also add just a, a tiny bit of border radius uh, to these lines. Uh, border radius, uh, let's do like two pixels. And that's going to make them nice and rounded. Okay, so how are we going to animate these so that they turn into an X when the when the menu is opened? Well, it's quite simple. We have three lines, but an X only has two lines. So we need to hide the middle line. That's one step. We also need to bring the top line and the bottom line to the middle. And from there, we need to rotate them around their centers to 45 degrees. And that's going to create an X. So let's start uh, doing that. And let me show you what I'm doing uh, from the JavaScript point of view. When we click the menu button, I'm targeting the root element, which is the HTML. And I'm just toggling an attribute called menu open. And you can actually see that if we do a quick inspect here. And I click on on the button, right, you can see that it toggles the menu open. And we can also see the menu because that's already made from uh, from CSS. So it just toggles menu open on and off. That's it. Now, going back to the uh, to the animation here, I showed you that because that's how we're going to target the open and close states. So we're going to say root with an attribute of menu open menu button span nth child one. This basically just targets the very first line, the top line. So what do we want to do is set a transform to it of translate 3D. And we're going to push it down so that it's perfectly overlaps the middle line. And I did the calculations, it's six pixels. And I also want to rotate it to 45 degrees. So now, if we click, we briefly saw the transformation, but the uh, the color of the menu uh, button is actually the same color as the background, so we cannot see it. But let's do that. Let's target the menu button span separately when the menu is opened, and I'm going to set the background color to color BG. Okay, so the first line is now positioned correctly. It's it overlaps the uh, the center line and it's rotated. Let's do the same for the bottom line. All right, so let's duplicate that. Let's target line number three. This time we're gonna move it up instead of down, and the rotation is gonna be the other way around. So now it looks like this. But now let's see what we do with the second line with the middle line. So we're going to target nth child two. And here on the transform, let's just do a scale x of zero. So we're basically shrinking it to zero on the x axis. And let's set the opacity to zero. So now we just get an x. But that's not much of an animation, is it? It's just a sudden change. So let's fix that. Let's go to the span here. And let's say this transition, transform 0.3 seconds, easy and out. What else are we supposed to transition the opacity of the middle line. So let's do opacity. Oops, I actually meant to do that. So opacity 0.3 seconds. Same thing. Uh, what else? The background color of the spans. Let's do a 0.5 seconds. Easy and out. Okay. So now, click. And we get a nice animation. And that's how you can easily turn a hamburger icon to an X and vice versa. And what we just created here is called a micro interaction. I'm just going to introduce this, uh, this new term for you. And a micro interaction is basically a brief moment of interaction between 
the user and the UI, right? So for example, the like buttons, right? If you click the, the like button on X, like I showed you previously, that does something, it creates an animation. Well, that's a micro interaction because it's super brief, just like this one. It's just a simple animation that shows me the original menu icon turned into an X. And this is now telling me that, okay, this is where you need to click to close out that menu, right? That's a very brief interaction, but one that does its job. And we actually created a, a micro interaction before, if you can remember, uh, was it in exercise 11 or 10? Yeah, right here, this one where we changed the text to the uh, dots, that was also a micro interaction. And that's a very easy way of creating this very popular animation. I'm sure you've seen it around and at some point you're gonna have to create something similar to this. So I think it's a great one to have in your toolkit. Now, there are a billion ways of animating icons and I invite you to discover uh, other ways of doing that. Uh, using SVGs uh, is also a very popular, but we could probably make an entire course just about that. So for, for the time being, uh, we're just going to stick to this one demo. Now, let's talk about animating illustrations. And for that, we'll go to practical exercise number 13. And we're going to use the exact same demo as before. But this time, we're going to focus our attention on a different part of the page, in particular, to this animation right here, which can be uh, downloaded from Innovato Elements, you can find the link in the uh, lesson description and in the video description as well. Now, how do we animate an illustration like this? Well, the most important part is that we have the uh, layered version. Okay, so this is an SVG that I have here in Figma. And as you can see, it's layered. Each individual piece is a separate layer. Without this, if you want to animate the individual pieces of it, you're going to have to cut it yourself. If uh, you had like a raster image. But because we have it as a as a layered SVG, it's, uh, it's really easy for us to work with it. So I want to animate a couple of different elements. And before we get to the code part, we're going to work a little bit here in Figma, because we need to group those elements and give them some proper names. That's going to really help us later on. So first of all, I want to animate the stars, right? You can see that each one of these stars is a separate layer. It's a vector. Okay. So let's grab this, 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 and this we have five stars, and we're going to group them up. And I'm going to call them stars. Next up, I have this location pin here, and I'm going to rename that to uh, location pin. And let's also give it a dash there. Uh, next up, I would like to animate this line, right? I want to make like a, a dotted line, which gets slowly animated. But I can't really do that with this vector, because of the way it's constructed. So I'm going to have to recreate this line myself. That's uh, not really hard to do. Let's grab the pen here. Let's start here. And I'm just going to create a few points trying to match the curve there. Doesn't have to be super perfect. I'm not the best illustrator. Okay, but that should uh, should do the trick for now. So let's actually move it up just a bit. And what I'm going to do is go to the stroke options here. And under stroke style, I'm going to select dash. And I'm going to set the dashes to be about, mm, I don't know, 20. No, that's too much 16, maybe like eight pixels. And the gaps, um, maybe a bit less. Or actually, I, th I think we'll leave it at that, at uh, at that eight and eight. Let's round off the uh, the caps there. 
can also, also change the uh, stroke to maybe eight. No, that's way too much. Two or three. I think two should, uh, should do the trick fine. And let's also grab the color for that. Paste it in. All right. So now I can bring it in like so. And I can actually, I can hide that original one or I can delete it all together if I want to. Let's call this dotted line. And that looks pretty good. It looks relatively close to uh, to what we had before. Great. So that's the dotted line. And then we have the uh, these icons for the plane, the boat, uh, the train and the bus. I want to animate those as well. So let's grab, uh, let's see, these should be together here. So let's grab this. Let's call it icon. Uh, what is this plane? Then we have this. That's icon boat. And then we have the next one. Group that up. That's icon uh, bus. And this final one without that one. That's icon train. Okay. So we've now grouped all the elements that I want to animate. The next step is to select this SVG, click on export, make sure you select SVG from here, and then go to the three dots and check include ID attributes. That's a, this is very important. So now you can export this as an SVG. But we're actually gonna go in here, right click and select copy as a SVG. And then we're going to go into our code editor, all the way down here in the uh, HTML part. And we're going to paste that in. So as you can see, it's a big, big, big SVG. But the important parts are that because we checked this box here, we now have the correct groups with the correct IDs, with the layer names from Figma, basically, right? So we can target those in, uh, in CSS. So for the time being, let's just collapse that SVG. Let's save. And now we can go back to our page. And everything looks like it did before. Except we now have uh, an internal SVG. And we have access to the layers to the layers that we're interested in, and we can start animating. So let's jump back to VS Code right here. And let's start with the stars. So in our SVG, I actually have to expand this again. Uh, we have our stars group. And in that group, we have a couple of paths. So let's actually rename these vectors to star dash zero one, all the way to zero five, because we have five stars. So that's number two. Number three, I forgot to do this in uh, in Figma. But that's fine. And zero five. Okay, so now we can say the following. We're going to use uh, an attribute selector in CSS, I want to select all the elements whose IDs contain star dash. Okay. And I want to do the following, I want to add an animation that lasts, let's say six seconds. It has a standard timing function. It goes on and on and on, alternate, and let's call the animation pulse. So let's create that animation, keyframes pulse. So for the pulse, we're going to do something simple, 0% 100% transform scale one, and also opacity one. And then at 50%, it's going to be transform scale zero, opacity zero very standard animation, right? So now let's check it out. And this is what happens. We can also set the transform origin to center so that the um, animation will start from the center or relative to the center of the element. But it's still not what we're after, right? Because these stars, these SVGs are sure they're scaling up and down, but they're not scaling relative to themselves. 
Okay, they're scaling relative to the middle of this entire viewport, to the bigger SVG, to, or to the middle of the uh, larger SVG. And that's because these are using uh, a property called transform box. Uh, by default, it uses a value of view box, which uses the viewport of the nearest SVG as a reference. So to get around that, to make sure that the individual SVGs are animating in relation to their own bounding box, uh, we're going to do this. Let's give the illustration on or this big SVG an ID of illustration so we can target it in CSS. And I'm going to say illustration, and I'm going to select all the elements. And I'm simply going to say transform box. I'm going to set that to fill box. As I said, a view box is the default, but it uses the viewport of the nearest SVG as the reference. Fill box uses the object's bounding box as the reference. Okay, so now after we save this, you'll see that the individual SVGs, yeah, they're now uh, creating those animations or performing those animations in relation to their own position and size, which is exactly what we want. And let's actually go and um, set a delay for these because I don't want them uh, animating at the same time. So right here, I'm going to say star two animation delay, let's say, I don't know, 1.2 seconds, and star three, four and five. Let's increase this, let's double it, in fact, so 2.4 seconds, uh, 3.6. So not, uh, sorry, not double, just add 1.2 seconds on each, uh, each of these. So 4.8. Okay, so now you see that these will animate, but they're going to be staggered, right? Not all at the same time, but one now, one after 1.2 seconds, one after 4.8 seconds. So uh, the effect is totally uh, or kind of random. Okay, so that's the first uh, animation done. That's for the stars. Okay, let's see about the location pin, right? It's this one. Now, what kind of animation would I want to create here? Let me actually make this bigger. Uh, it's a location pin. It shows a location, right? And it should draw the attention to a specific location. So how about we do a bounce animation? Hmm? So for the bounce animation, let's do this. I'm going to say uh, location pin, I believe I called it. So location pin, uh, let's do animation. Let's do four seconds infinite. Now let's do a bounce animation. And then we'll say keyframes, bounce. And now instead of trying to create a bounce animation from scratch, which can be quite hard, we can uh, use an existing one. So if we go to animate CSS, uh, this is uh, a CSS animation library created by Daniel Eden. Uh, we have a bounce animation, something like this. And we can actually uh, check out the uh, the core, the source of that. If we go to the uh, to the CSS and we search for bounce, quite simple, right? And actually, let's just copy the entire keyframes from here. And I'm going to paste them right here. Just going to do a bit of cleanup here. Uh, we don't actually need the, the prefixes here. And as you can see, uh, this is using some custom um, timing functions. And it would have taken us quite a bit uh, to do it from scratch. So let's do that. And finally, that. And finally, that. And of course, normally, I would leave the these in the uh, the vendor prefixes, but I want to make this code as clean as possible for you so uh, you can understand this better. So now, this is how the animation looks like. Cool. Let's move on. What else do we have? We have the dotted line, right? This one. And actually, I think I'm going to recreate it uh, with CSS, right? So 
Uh, we have a stroke with two stroke dash array here. Let's actually remove this attributes so that I just have the uh, the line here, right? It's currently invisible. So now we can go to CSS and we can say dotted line. So I'm going to set the stroke. I can do the stroke width. I can do the stroke dash array, it, uh, which was what, eight and eight. And to animate it, let's start with a dash offset of, let's say, 120. And let's not forget the stroke line cap round just to uh, to make those dashes uh, round. And then let's uh, create the animation. So I'm going to say keyframes dash. And in here, I'm just going to say two stroke dash offset zero. And let's also let's do five seconds, linear, infinite, and dash. Okay, so now the animation just keeps going and going and going. And if I don't like how it looks like, I can always play around with uh, the values here, like I can increase the, uh, the stroke width, the dashes. It's a subtle animation, but if I were to make every single animation here like super big and obvious, uh, I think it would be too much. So we're doing a little bit here with the stars, a little bit here with the location marker, uh, a little bit with the uh, with the dashed line, and finally let's do a little bit with the four icons. So travel icons. I would like these to have like a breathing effect where they momentarily scale up and then scale back down. So let's do this. Let's target, uh, what was it, icon uh, bus, icon plane. And actually, you know what, let's, uh, let's add a class here. Let's add a class of animated icon to all of these because it's going to be a bit easier to, uh, to target, right? So icon dash, okay, let's add it here. Let's add it here. And let's add it here. Great. So now back in CSS, I can just target that animated icon class. So what do we do here? First of all, I'm going to set the transform origin to the center because I want the kind of the scale to uh, to originate from the center. And then I want let's set the keyframes here. Let's add a breathe effect. And here, very simple, 0%, 100%, transform scale one, and then 50%. That's going to be a transform scale 1.4. So now let's add the uh, keyframes. And I'm going to say animation. Let's go it over one second. Let's do an ease in out and breathe. And let's do infinite. Now let's add an animation delay for each of these. So I'm going to say animated icon nth child two, let's say so let's target the second one. So animation uh, delay, one second, let's actually do this uh, three and four. And let's uh, increase this by one second, like this. Uh, oh, sorry, what am I doing? No. That's, I was wondering why this wasn't working. This is a class. So what am I doing using nth child on that? Uh, here we can just use the IDs. So uh, icon boat, icon bus, and icon train. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I had a, a kind of a brain freeze there. I don't know what happened. Okay, so we're kind of getting to where we want kind of it's not exactly the effect that we're after because i want these sure to repeat themselves but not like this so i want the plane to scale up boat to scale up bus and then train and then wait a bit and then go over again if i'm using infinite here the animation here sure will go right the first time but then it just keeps going on and on. So this is actually something that we cannot do with CSS. I would like to find a way to uh, create this repeating animation 
with a delay at the end, but just like the way I specified. So this animates, then this, then this, then this, not all at the same time. And for that, we actually need to restart the animation. So let's do this. Let's remove the infinite from here. And you'll see the animation runs once. And that's perfect. That's exactly what I want. So now after a set interval, I want to restart the animation. Unfortunately, we cannot do that from CSS. We need to use some sort of JavaScript. So let's do the following. Let's collapse this SVG. And in the JavaScript part of our document, I'm going to create a function called animate icons that basically does the following. Uh, let's grab all of those icons in a node list. So I'm going to say const icons equals uh, document dot query selector all and I'm just going to target that animated icon class. After that, I'm going to do a for each. Uh, so icon, and I'm going to say icon dot class list dot remove. And we're going to use an animated class. Now the animated class is simply going to hold that animation uh, property. Okay. So uh, what, are we, what are we doing? We're removing the animated class from each of the icons, and then we're reapplying it. So icons, again, for each, we're going to reapply it. So now let's uh, run it once. Okay. And then we need to repeat it every six seconds. So we're going to set an interval and we're going to run the animate icons function every six seconds. Okay, so now it finishes one, two, three, four, five, six, and nothing happens. So why is this? Well, it has something to do with the document reflow. You see, in order to restart an animation, you have to force a document reflow. And one of the ways to do that, let's just say here force reflow to restart animation. And one of the ways to do that is to just query like the width or the height of a specific element. So we can do a void here because we don't actually need this value. We can say document query selector. And let's get, uh, I don't know, the hero section, although you can get whatever uh, element you want, and we're, we're just going to set offset width. Okay, that's going to force what's called a reflow in the document. And uh, this will essentially uh, make that animation restart. As you can see here, every six seconds, that animation just gets restarted. Uh, there are better ways of achieving this with animation libraries, as you'll, as you'll see, in uh, future lessons in this course. But for now, I just wanted to show you a pure, like vanilla JavaScript uh, approach. So whenever you want to, you know, restart an animation, and removing a class and then adding it back doesn't work, remember, you have to force a reflow. And something simple like this, uh, like uh, querying the uh, offset width of an element, will do that for you. Uh, just bear in mind that uh, the DOM reflow operation can be quite expensive, uh, which requires a lot of CPU power. And, um, you know, sometimes it can cause uh, a bad user experience. So just make sure you use this wisely. Uh, let's take a final look. Just by doing that, we've now uh, successfully created an animated illustration. And that's just one of the ways of animating an illustration. And we did that with um, an illustration that wasn't probably designed uh, to be animated in the first place. Now, if you're aiming for more complex animations, then it's probably a good idea to design your illustration with that goal in mind. And this is particularly useful when dealing with uh, let's say cartoon characters or game characters. Okay, so let me show you what I mean by that. 
by going to practical exercise number 14. Now, this is what I want to create. So I've actually done most of the uh, uh, styling here. Okay, so we're basically uh, choosing our adventure, either it's Luna or Max or Zombo or Ribsy. And the idea is that I want to display these cartoon characters. And by the way, you can get these on Envato Elements. And when I select one of them, I want to animate it. And these are actually animated uh, characters. I have walking sequences for all four of them, right? You can see I have individual images. There are eight items in the sequence. There are basically eight uh, stages of the walking process for all four characters. And what I did was I opened up the, um, the Adobe Illustrator file. I grabbed each of the SVGs and I pasted it in a frame that has the same, the exact same width and height. In my case, it's 520 by 880. So all of these have exactly the same width and height. And the same goes for the other characters as well. And this is important because I want these to be consistent uh, when I'm loading them inside the, uh, the container boxes. And then I took this entire uh, group of images and I exported as SVG. So now, if we uh, take a look back in the code and we go to illustrations, you'll see that we have uh, a Luna walking sequence, a Max, a Ribsy, and a Zombo walking sequence in SVG. Now, how can we animate this? It's actually quite simple and very, very cool. So let's actually open up exercise 14 here. And as you can see, I've already done um, all of the HTML. We have some uh, a card container that basically has these four cards. And each white card here is represented by a div with a class of card. And we have an H2 that has the name of the character and then a figure which is going to hold our uh, image. Okay, so let's start styling. Let's do this. Let's start with Luna, right? And here I'm just going to set a background image and I'm going to give it a URL, illustrations and Luna walking sequence. Save that. Nothing happens just yet. We need to select the card figure and give it some dimensions, right? With, let's say 190 pixels, uh, height, let's say 320 pixels. Uh, and let's go with a background repeat none and background size cover. All right. So now our character completely fills that figure element. Now let's add the rest of the team. So we're going to have Max, we're going to have Zombo, and we're going to have Ribsy. Cool. Now let's animate them. I want to run that walking sequence or to animate that walking sequence when I select a card. So card with the class of selected figure. Yeah, we're gonna set an animation. Let's say to one second, let's say linear, infinite, and the animation name is going to be walking. So let's create the animation. Here's how we do that. We say two background position 100%. <laughs> That's it, right? We can wrap it up? No, not exactly. Uh, it's still not walking. All this is doing, it's basically animating my background position from zero to 100%. And because I'm displaying this as a background image, right, it's going to be confined within the boundaries of that figure element. Now, this is the stuff that's not working. It's the timing function. I'm using linear. So obviously, it's gonna, you know, let's increase this. Uh, it's gonna 
slowly move that background position, right? But I don't want that. I want the animation to just switch instantly to the next um, to the next frame, so to speak, right? So I want uh, to switch from this to this to this to this. That's how you create the illusion of of walking, right? That's that's how cartoons are made. They're or the old cartoons. They're they were drawn frame by frame by frame, and then they would quickly switch between those frames to give you the illusion of movement. So instead of linear, we're going to use steps. Now steps is a timing function that allows us to break the animation or transition into segments, right? Rather than using one continuous transition, we're breaking it into segments. And the way to make this work is you need to specify the, no the total number of frames, which in our case is eight, right? Because we have eight images, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, so the total number of frames or images minus one. So we're gonna set steps seven. And we're gonna bring the duration back to one second. So now we have a character that's walking. And it works on this one, and this one, or whatever it is, we select it. Right? So as a recap, what we're doing here is we're animating the background position, but instead of using like a regular timing function like ease or linear or whatever, which will create a visible movement, we're using steps. And steps allows us to break the animation into segments. Essentially, we're switching between one of the one of the images to the other without any kind of visible transition in between. And this allows us uh, to create this, uh, this walking effect. So in this lesson, we learned about animating illustrations and icons. These can enhance the user experience if used properly. Animated illustrations and icons can increase the engagement, catching the user's attention, and often making them more likely to stay and explore. Animations can also be used for guiding a user through a process or drawing the focus to certain key elements. The UX or user experience is also enhanced when animation is used to provide instant feedback on actions, like for example, changing a hamburger icon to a close icon on click. Also, a well animated icon or illustration can make a static page feel less boring and more entertaining. But do this sensibly because too much animation can be distracting or even annoying. On the technical side, we learned that animating an illustration is easily done by first grouping the relevant elements, then loading the illustration as an inline SVG, and then animating the individual elements. Another option is to set the illustration as a background image and then animate the background position. This approach works best for creating animated characters. The key part is to use the steps timing function to break the animation into segments. Now, time to move on. And it just occurred to me that I haven't made a clever superhero reference in quite some time. So how about this? We all know and love Doctor Strange, right? But what's the one thing that makes him stand out? It's the nose, right? No, I'm just kidding. It's the cape, It's the red cape. No other character has a cool cape like that. Well, apart from Thor, Superman, Supergirl, Magneto, Batwoman? Anyway, uh, Doctor Strange's cape is like way cooler, it can fly. It's almost like it has a life of its own. Now, the reason I brought it up is that Doctor Strange's cape is like an accent piece in his wardrobe. Okay? Similarly, animations can be used 
to the same effect, to draw attention, right? You can use accent animations to draw the user's attention to a specific part of the page. In web design, accent animations are small, purposeful animations that enhance a visual storytelling and user experience without being the main focus. They're like the spices in a dish, not the main ingredient, but essential for the flavor. That's why I mentioned Dr. Strange's cape. Is it the main thing? No, but it adds to his awesomeness. Um, can Dr. Strange be a powerful superhero without the cape? Sure, but it's not the complete picture. Now, before we move on, I just want to make a quick note. The animation types we're exploring in this lesson, loading, accent, interactive, uh, they're not locked into these unique categories. So, for example, a loading animation can also be accent, or a scroll triggered animation is also interactive, right? So if you see a loading type animation being used in the accent lesson, it's okay, don't get too hung up on labels. I'm uh, kind of categorizing these animation types based on their primary function, but in the end, they all uh, belong to this bigger picture of motion design. Got it? All right. Now, uh, we were talking about accent animations, and uh, here's what you would typically use these for. First, to direct attention, to guide users to important elements in the page. For example, if we go to Ship Daddy's website and scroll all the way to the bottom, we can see this simple illustration of uh, the character just pointing up, and it's drawing our attention to this area right here, which basically allows us to, um, uh, to go to the contact page or something. Very simple, very cool. Uh, if we go to Feedly, and again, we scroll to the very end, we have the robot looking character uh, doing a very subtle animation that basically waves at us, uh, drawing our attention to this area, to this footer area, which is basically a call to action. Next up, um, we go to the Embassy IO website where they have these cool uh, handwritten animations. And we also have like a drawn uh, arrow pointing to, uh, to some important links like Behance here or uh, to the Figma link right here. Very easy to do and uh, they have a great effect. Uh, next up, let's go to Vool Studio where on the top left, we can see a simple, uh, simple movement really in the header, uh, where they change, they dynamically change these words to, um, to probably showcase their, uh, their services. And also the Vool uh, site has a cool animation here in the footer of the logo, which uh, changes periodically. Again, drawing our attention to this, uh, to this area right here. And finally, uh, we are watching or we're uh, visiting liftoffcourse.com where uh, they are using a typewriter effect in the hero area. Again, drawing our attention to this H1 element. Accent animations can also be used for enhancing interactions by providing feedback. As an example, we're visiting Dennis's website, where if we hover on a specific button, yeah, we get some nice movement, a nice accent animation. It's just subtle, but it's there, and it's present on all of its buttons. Pretty cool. And then uh, if we go to the Moxian Power uh, website and we scroll all the way down to the uh, testimonials, we can see we have some very subtle effects on hover. So here uh, it changes this, uh, this background element. 
It also rounds off the corners of the card just a little bit more, like so. And it also transforms this dot into uh, an arrow, basically. Pretty cool. Subtle, but very effective in, uh, in enhancing the user experience. Finally, accent animations can be used to improve usability. By visually signaling what can be interacted with, they can make interfaces um, easier to use and more intuitive. And we go back to the uh, Dog Studio website where uh, we see on the bottom right a very simple ripple animation on this dot here. And this is actually for toggling the sound on and off. It's a very subtle animation, but one that's very usable or one that increases the usability because when you open the website and uh, sound is playing, you're like, oh, okay, hold on. Where is this coming from and how can I turn it off? And by visually uh, doing these, these ripple effects like sound waves, uh, you can immediately see, oh, okay, this might be a toggle of some sort. And you click and the sound is off. All right, so we saw how accent animations are being used out there, but how exactly do you create some of these? Well, let's find out, starting with practical exercise number 15. For this demo, I would like to animate this logo, right? And it can be used in many different places. I showed you a few examples earlier where a Vool, for example, had the logo in their footer and it, has a, it had a simple animation, or you could use this as a page loader. It really depends uh, on where or on the effect that you want to, um, uh, to get with it. Uh, for me, personally, I would like to use this as a page loader. So I found this uh, very simple logo on Envato Elements, and I went ahead and recreated it in Figma. So what I have here is basically three paths. Uh, we have this middle path, which is like a, an elongated circle, if I may call it like that, and then uh, two halves, one on the left and one on the right. So what I'm going to do is simply um, select that, make sure it's exported as SVG, and make sure this box here is checked to uh, include the ID attributes as uh, from the layer names. And then I can simply copy as SVG and I can jump into my code editor and I can paste it right here. And as you can see, we have a group here. We can get rid of this. Uh, and then we have a rectangle with an ID of middle, path, right and left. And uh, there are a couple of things that uh, we can uh, do here to simplify this. So stroke, let's actually change this to black, and I'm going to remove the stroke width. Let's do the same for the paths, and also the stroke line cap. So let's remove those. So now all we're left with is just the, uh, the rectangle, the paths with a uh, black stroke. And if we want, we can also just remove this. We don't need it. Okay, so checking our page here, this is what we have. So let's animate this. But this time, I'm going to introduce you to one of the coolest JavaScript animation libraries out there, and that is GSAP. Right? So with GSAP, you can basically do animations like this. And it's super powerful, super easy to use. And in fact, we're going to use GSAP from now on for the rest of this course to create uh, the rest of the demos. Now, the way I want to animate this is uh, we have this middle piece. And I want to kind of scale it up and rotate it. And then from it, I want to start drawing the rest of these shapes. I want to draw the left side and then the right side. Okay, and it's not just going to appear, it's going to be drawn. It's like you would take a pencil and draw it. 
So for that, we need two things. We need the core uh, GCAP library. So that we can take from a CDN. So let's grab it from here. And we'll paste it right here. Okay, let me zoom in here a little bit. And finally, we need a plugin uh, that's called Draw SVG. Now, Draw SVG is uh, a paid plugin. So you would need to, uh, to sign up to use it in, uh, in a real project. Uh, for this demo, we can uh, use a, a trial of it. So uh, just use this link if you want to use the plugin just to test things out. And then finally, uh, we're going to write, oops, this is not CSS. So we loaded GSAP, we loaded the draw SVG plugin. Now we're ready to start animating. Uh, but first, let's write just a tiny bit of CSS, because I want to target the rectangle in that SVG, and also the path uh, to set a stroke color. And we're going to use 100319. Uh, and also uh, a stroke width of a 20. And also let's do stroke uh, line cap round. Okay. So this is what we have so far. It's very, very similar to our uh, to our logo here. Now let's animate it. So the way GSAP works is super cool. So you can use the GSAP object and a couple of methods like from to set and a few others. So for example, uh, I have this SVG, let me give it or actually, let's, uh, let's target this middle part. Yeah. Let's say I want to set the middle part to scale to 0 0.5. And this just scales it down to whatever value I set here. And this is uh, the general syntax, you specify the uh, target, and then you pass in an object with all the changes that you want to make. And you can do scale, you can do uh, like x 20, and that's going to move it to the right 20 pixels, and a few others we will uh, will discover this as we uh, as we move on. But here's how you create an actual animation. Let's say I want to, uh, to scale up this middle part, right? So by default, I'm going to set it to zero, and I'm going to set its transform origin to 50% 50%. So then I can say GSAP to again, we're going to target that middle element, we're going to pass in an object with the following properties, I want the scale to be one, I want the rotate uh, rotation is actually correct, rotation 360 degrees. And let's give it a duration of 1.2 seconds. So now watch what happens. That's going to animate the middle from whatever was set before, either with GSAP or just from a regular CSS to these properties to scale one rotation 360 over 1.2 seconds. So it's that easy to animate with GSAP. And GSAP, what's really cool about this is it has a bunch of easings. So uh, if you search for easing, in the uh, in the docs here, uh, you can actually see a visualizer. And there are a bunch of them to choose from elastic is a pretty cool one, right? And you can click this again to see a preview. And if you want, if you like it, you can actually copy this. And you can paste it in your code. In my case, I'm just going to say elastic dot out. So now, the animation looks like this. Uh, you can see that uh, th this is getting a bit cut off because it scales a little bit past the viewport, but we can easily fix that by saying SVG uh, overflow visible. Right? How easy was that? And now we can keep going and animate the rest of the elements. But here's one of the coolest things about GSAP, you can use timelines. And a timeline is basically a sequence of events. 
So let's create a timeline ourselves. So we're going to say var or let or whatever. Let's do let uh, tl or whatever you want to call it. gsap dot timeline. Okay, and we can pass in uh, an object of properties. For now, we'll leave this blank. So here we actually worked on the uh, middle rectangle. So we scaled up and we rotated. But instead of doing gsap2, let's use the timeline. So I'm going to say timeline2. And by doing this, we're essentially adding this uh, tween, this animation to the timeline. Now, the events that are placed in a timeline happen or take place in order. So this will happen, then the next event will happen, the next one, and so on. So now let's animate the left handle drawing. Now here we're going to say TL, the timeline, and we're going to use something called a from to method. And we're going to target the left one. Now from to receives two parameters, the properties that should be set initially, that's the from, and the properties it should be animated to, okay, from to. So I want this, uh, this left handle to go like this, draw SVG 100%, 100%, and then two, draw SVG 0%, 100%. And I'm also going to set a duration, let's say 1.2 seconds. As for easing, we're going to use power four in out. So let's see what we got. So the middle part animates. And then the next animation in the timeline happens, where we draw the left handle. Now, what exactly is up with these percentages, right? 100%, 0%. So when dealing with draw SVG, these values describe the stroked portion of the overall SVG element. So in my case, 0%, 100% will render the stroke between 0 and 100. So it will render the whole thing. If I were to set this 20% uh, and 70%, it will only render the stroke between 20% and 70% of the total length of that stroke. Okay, or if I were to do between 40% and 50%, that will only generate it uh, between those percentages. Okay, so the way I'm doing it here is that I'm starting from the end because this is on the left side. And uh, when animating a stroke, it goes left to right, right? It goes like this. So if I were to animate this from 0%, 0%, it would animate it from here. Okay. But by setting it to 100%, 100%, it means the starting point is at the end. Okay, so it starts to animate it from here, it basically does the, the animation kind of in reverse, right? So the end position is to draw the SVG between the zero and 100% point. And I'm doing that over 1.2 seconds. And I'm using a custom easing. So the effect is this, it goes from here to here. So I hope that makes sense. Now, let's see about the right handle. And the right handle, we're just going to duplicate this code, we're going to animate the right handle drawing. So we're going to target the right side. Now we're going to animate from 00 to 0100. Okay, so now we animate the left, and then we animate the right. That's pretty awesome. Now, how about we also change the color because in the in the uh, Figma design, we uh, we have a different color uh, here at the end. Uh, we can easily do that with GSAP. We have a timeline. So let's change the color. And let's say timeline two. And this time, we're going to select middle, left, and right. So you can select multiple elements. And we're going to pass in the object that says stroke 
is going to be equal to a 41 ff6 with a duration of let's say 0.4 seconds so now this animates left animates right animates and then i change color and now finally what if i want to repeat this over and over well we can go to the timeline and we can pass in some parameters there i can say repeat let's say two times that's going to repeat once or it's going to execute once and it's going to go again and again so it repeats two times if i wanted to repeat indefinitely i can just say minus one and now this will just keep going and going and going now what's nice about gsap is that you can add a repeat delay between these uh, animations so you can say repeat delay let's say 1.6 seconds so now it's gonna run the animation it's gonna wait 1.6 seconds and then repeat it but what if i want the animation to run in reverse like alternate between forward direction and reverse direction like we have in css we can add another parameter called yo-yo yo-yo true so now it's going to run the animation normally and when it reaches the end it's going to do it in reverse and then it starts all over again now one of the examples i showed you earlier in this lesson was a typewriter effect where uh, you would dynamically change one or two words in that sentence so let me actually show you how to create that typewriter effect with gsap in practical exercise number 16. now this is the stuff that we're trying to create we basically have this uh, big title big headline in the hero area and i want to change the last word right you can see we have a cursor here and on, i want to change that at a set interval with of course a typewriter effect where each letter at a time gets deleted and then when it reaches the end it gets it uh, gets replaced with another word so to do that uh, this is what we have currently in uh, in our page and if we take a look in our code here uh, we can see that the h1 has a span inside it for um, for that word that uh, is about to be changed now we're actually going to comment this and we're going to change it with something else so we're also going to have or we're still going to have an h1 however uh, we're going to have two spans right so one will have the id of typewriter and it's going to be blank and the other one is going to be have an id of cursor and we can just put like a pipe character in there save that so that's the html part taken care of now let's animate it and again we're going to use gsap so we're going to click here get gsap we're going to click get uh, from cdn and we're going to also use a plugin here the text plugin right so copy this and let's go down here paste it in and let's start animating we're going to define a constant for the words and that's going to be an array that looks like this boldness clarity originality and precision next we're going to create the main timeline so let main timeline equals gsap dot timeline and uh, let's actually make this repeat indefinitely okay so here's what we're going to do for each word we're going to create a new timeline we're going to use the text plugin and we're going to append that timeline to the main one you can do that in gsap so we're going to say words for each word we're going to create the text timeline and that's going to be equal to gsap.timeline and we'll leave this blank for now so now animating the actual word we're going to say uh, text timeline 2 we're going to select the typewriter span 
and we're going to pass in the following. I want the text of it to be the word, so the one that we're getting from the array. Uh, we can also set a duration, let's say one second, and then we can say main timeline dot add text timeline. Okay, so it kind of works, but it's not the effect that we're after. So let's do this. In the main timeline, or sorry, in the text timeline, I want this to repeat just one time. And I want it to go back and forth. So yo yo true. Okay, so now it types the word, then it deletes it. And I also want a repeat delay of let's say six seconds. And this six seconds is the time between the words is typed and the word is deleted. So uh, GSAP uh, types the word like so. It waits six seconds and then it wipes it like this. And that's really all you have to do with it just by using uh, the simple approach with two timelines. Uh, you can create a typewriter effect with GSAP. Now, there is still the issue of the cursor, right? The cursor, typically, whenever uh, you're, uh, you're typing text somewhere, the cursor is blinking, right? So let's add a blinking effect. Now, we can do that with CSS, and it's quite easy to do. So in CSS, we would do something like this. Let's select keyframes. Uh, blink. So for the blink, we're going to set on start and end opacity 0 and at 50% opacity 1. So then we're going to target the cursor and we're going to say animation. Let's do it over 1.2 seconds, infinite, and the animation is called blink. Right? So that's what it looks like. But a, a regular cursor doesn't just uh, show its opacity, it doesn't just fade in and fade out. So instead of uh, using a default timing function, we're going to be using steps one. And this is basically just appearing, disappearing, appearing, disappearing. Okay, that's an easy way to create a blinking effect in CSS. But here's the thing that I don't like. The cursor blinks even when the text is typed or deleted. And on pretty much any text editor, the cursor is always visible when you're typing or, or when you're deleting. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we tie in this animation with what we're doing in GSAP? Well, short answer, we cannot. So how about we ditch this animation from CSS and we replicate the blinking animation with GSAP. So that goes something like this. I'm going to say blinking cursor. So we're going to create a cursor timeline. And again, we're going to repeat it indefinitely. And let's add a repeat delay of, let's say, about 0.8 seconds. So what do we do? We say cursor timeline two. We're going to target the cursor and we're going to do the following. We're going to say opacity one and duration zero. And then we're going to chain another two method on the cursor where we're going to set the opacity to zero. Duration zero again, this is very important and we can set a delay of 0.8. So now we get the same blinking effect, but with GSAP. So let's see what happens here. First of all, we have a timeline, right? So these two events happen in succession. First of all, we're setting the opacity to one and the duration to zero. This basically removes any kind of transition between the two states. And then the next animation is to set the opacity to zero. But to simulate the time between visible and invisible, 
we're setting this delay to 0.8 seconds. Easy enough, right? So now we replicated the cursor animation in GSAP, but how do we tie it into our original timeline? How do we make it that the cursor stays visible when typing or deleting a word? Well, that's when we can go to the text timeline and we can tap into some events. For example, on update, and we can pass in a function, we can say, take the cursor timeline, restart it, so the, the cursor remain, remains visible, and then pause it, so it stays like that. And when the text timeline is complete, so we can say, on complete, we can say, take the cursor timeline, and play it. So now, when the word is typed or deleted, the cursor will remain visible. After that, its animation, its blinking animation is resumed. How cool is that, that you can do stuff like this with GSAP and with, the, I meant with JavaScript and GSAP allows you to do a whole lot more and the fact that you can you know restart pause play a timeline any time you want is super super powerful now before we wrap up this uh this lesson there is one more example i want to show you and uh, we're going to use the same demo and this time it's just going to be a css thing so uh notice the element here we have our work and then an arrow down and let's say I want to turn this arrow, I want to animate it just to kind of bounce up and down and show me that, uh, you know, hey, you can scroll down and see more content. This is also a type of accent animation, right? So I want to do that, but I also want to simulate a delay between iterations. As we know in CSS, if you've been paying attention uh, so far, I said that in CSS, you cannot add a delay between uh, the iterations of an animation, right? So if uh, you have a breathe animation and you, you can set a delay and it's going to be executed on the first run, but after that, if you set it to infinite, the animation will just keep running and running and running. Well, there is a CSS method of simulating a delay between iterations, and I want to show it to you right now. So uh, let's start by going to the CSS part of our page here. And I'm going to target, uh, I believe it's called our work, and I'm going to target the SVG, so that uh, this arrow here. And I'm going to say the following animation. I want it to run over five seconds. Let's do <clears throat> ease in out for now, infinite. And I want the animation to be called point down. So now let's define keyframes point down. And let's create it in such a way that it uh, it simulates a delay between uh, between its iterations, right? So for example, let's do this 0%. So the starting point is going to be a transform translate 3d 0, 0, 0. And at 100%, I want this to be transform Translate 3D, 0, uh, 1 rem, and 0. Okay, so now if we take a look at the animation, the arrow, you know, is pointing down, it's going down, and then it comes back up. But I want this to repeat at an interval, right? I don't want the animation to start right away after it finished. So to do that, we can say something like this, 10%. 40% and 100%. And here, let's swap this to 25%. So now let's look what happens. See, there is a delay between when the animation ends and when it starts again. So how does this work? Well, basically, I said here that in the start and in the end, I want the arrow to be its in its original position, but also at the 10% mark and at the 40% mark. And then 
only animated, only changes position at the 25% mark. So what happens is the animation itself takes place between 10% and 25% of the total animation duration, right? This is what it refers to. So the animation starts when it reaches 10% of its duration, it starts animating from this to this. It's going to finish animating when it reaches 25% of its duration. From that point, between 25% and 40%, it does it in reverse, right? It goes from this to this. And then from 40% to 100%, it's still in its default position, so it doesn't do anything. Okay, so if we set this animation to run over 10 seconds, right? You'll see the animation takes place between one second and four seconds. And at two and a half seconds is gonna be uh, down here. For the rest of the time, it's in the default position. But let's change this back to five seconds. So now, just to spice this up even further, how about we add a custom easing to it? Because, uh, you know, we have a couple of easings defined in CSS. We can do stuff like a linear, which will have no acceleration whatsoever. Uh, we can have the ease, which, you know, looks something like this. Or we can add a cubic Bezier. And there is actually a really cool website called cubicbezier.com where you can actually create your own curve and you can actually preview it, right? So the blue one is like one of the standard ones. You can select from here and the purple one or whatever color is this, uh, the uh, pink one is um, the one you're creating. You can change the uh, duration here as well, okay? And the one we're gonna create looks something like this. So we're going to go all the way down here, something like this. And we're going to take this handle and bring it all the way down here. So we're going to say, uh, maybe something like this, and a bit further down, something like this. Okay, so now, if we compare ours is the pink, right? So when it starts, it actually backs up a little and then accelerates and then it overshoots a little bit and then comes back to its original position, right? So we can copy that and we can replace ease with our custom Bezier. So now our uh, arrow will look like that. And it's just uh, a minor touch, but uh, it's yet another example of an accent animation. So in this lesson, we learned about accent animations and how these are the thoughtful touches that make a website not just usable, but enjoyable. They're like the spices in a dish, not the main ingredient, but essential for the flavor. We learned that accent animations can be used for guiding users to important elements in the page, for enhancing interaction by providing feedback, and for improving usability by visually signaling what can be interacted with. We also learned about a really cool JavaScript animation platform called GSAP, which stands for GreenSock Animation Platform. With GSAP, you can animate anything you want but also create timelines, which are basically animation sequences. We learned that creating custom easings is super simple with tools like cubicbezier.com, which allows you to create custom easing curves. And finally, we discovered that you can create a pause in a looping CSS animation by adjusting the keyframe percentages. This trick extends the time an element stays still giving a delay effect without extra code. So that wraps it up for accent animations. Next up, we're going to delve into what I consider to be the most popular 
type of animation, and that is interactive. In a nutshell, interactive animations respond to user input, like clicking, hovering, or scrolling. And they're not just for show. Here are four reasons you should be using them. Number one, enhanced user engagement. Interactive animations capture attention. By responding to user inputs, uh, they create a dynamic experience that keeps users engaged and interested. Let me show you some examples. We're here on Dennis's website, and I've showed you this before, but uh, this still applies. Uh, hover is an interaction, right? So when I hover on this button, the button responds. And it actually follows my cursor around, which is really cool. And these do as well. And also these, the portfolio items, right? As soon as I hover on them, they respond to my action and they create this uh, really cool movement. Then let's go to Apple's website for the iPhone 15. Now, as we scroll down, we have the ability to switch here between the 6.1 and the 6.7 inch, and this creates a nice animation. This is also an interactive animation because it's triggered by a user action. And the same thing goes for uh, changing the color, even though this is not uh, necessarily an animation. Number two, better storytelling. Interactive or more specifically scroll animations can be used to unfold a story or to reveal information in a more controlled way. And the idea is, as users scroll, they're taken on a visual journey, which uh, makes content more memorable. Let's look at the runway website. As we scroll, things start happening, they start animating, uh, we can see, you know, some of the features in here, we can see presentations of the product. And as we continue scrolling, as I was saying, a story unfolds, you know, it tells us what runway is. And it, um, it takes us to the various chapters of their presentation. And it's all animated, which makes it super, super cool. Here's another example. As we scroll down the site, besides the nice um, draw animation, again, we can see a story unfold, where the various uh, sections of the website, uh, all the presentation stuff, is revealed to us in a very uh, nice, memorable way. And it just keeps going uh, until the very end. Apple is also doing a great job with this. For example, this is the website for, or the web page for Apple Watch Series 9. And as we scroll down, you're gonna see a story unfold, you know, which is gonna tell us everything we need to know about this new Apple Watch. And we get to see like the various features of the watch in a nicely animated way. And Apple does this for a lot of their products, uh, which is uh, fantastic. You see, interactive animations can make a website feel more lively and personal, which uh, can be crucial for brand identity. Uh, it also means that website stands out from the sea of static pages we come across every day. And we're going to look at the Dog Studio uh, website again, because the interactive animations here made this a website instantly memorable for me. Uh, you know, from the way the, uh, the dog animation reacts to my mouse movements, uh, or the scrolling on a page, or the way it changes uh, the colors when I hover on these links. So everything, all of these things combined made this a super enjoyable experience for me, but also a, a super memorable one. If you ask me in a year's time, how did the website look like? I can like describe it to you in like a, with 80% accuracy, let's say. Uh, but yeah, it 
uh, it's gonna stick in my mind for a very very long time plus uh, this created an emotional connection with me because of the you know the name but also the this uh, beautiful um animation here because i'm a dog lo lover myself so uh, whenever i see something like this it, it hits a nerve so to speak in in the best way possible plus uh, you know the this website ticks the other two boxes as well uh, you know with the user engagement and the storytelling so overall yeah really really cool stuff using animations like this truly goes a long way number four increased time on site this type of animation can increase the time users spend on your site because they encourage exploration and interaction let's take a look at the hyperframe website now from what i understand this is a steel framing system that snaps together and i got that from the text right here so basically when we scroll down you get a super nice animation that shows us how this system works okay and of course as we scroll further and for uh, and further uh, the whole story unfolds it shows us uh, even more of how the system works and you know we also have this type of interactive animation where we don't have to scroll but instead we can drag to see how uh, those two pieces fit together and honestly these features uh, make me personally want to spend more time on this site you know playing around with them and seeing uh, these awesome uh, 3d animations okay so we've seen how real websites use interactive animations how about we create some of our own enter practical exercise number 17. now for this demo we're going to go back to dennis's website that was featured so many times in this course that you're probably sick of it but regardless i featured it for good reason it's an awesome website and it has some pretty sick animations like this one for example so in this demo i'm going to attempt to recreate this mouse follow effect on hover now when doing this i actually uh, took a sneak peek into the code that dennis wrote and you know we can find that if we go to uh, the assets the javascript and if we search for a magnetic okay uh, these are what uh, dennis calls magnetic buttons and he got inspiration from this code pen right here okay you can see the address right there and I took a sneak peek at Dennis's code uh, to see how he did it and then I adapted that to my own design so uh, if you want to go ahead and check out his code otherwise uh, let's jump to our own exercise and create our own magnetic button so the first thing to do is to uh, create the button itself and for that we'll go right here under the h1 and we're going to add a button with a class of magneto i know very original and inside we're going to put a span and we're actually going to give it a class of text and we're going to put the text our <laughs> our work actually not our text and then uh below that i'm going to use a div with an id of debugger and you'll see why we need this in uh, in just a little bit so that's all the html that uh, we're gonna need so taking a look we have a standard button let's go ahead and apply some uh, some default styling for that so we'll say magneto and let me zoom in here a little bit uh, let's give it a width 10 rems uh, height 10 10 rems uh, because i want to make a, a rounded button let's give it a border radius of 50 percent and let's remove the border and let's set a background color and i have a, a variable already defined for that let's set the color of the text to white and let's set a cursor to pointer great so now the button looks like this so basically i want to achieve uh the same effect as dennis here so 
the effect goes like this. It follows or it responds to the movements of my cursor. And when I hover on it, the button itself kind of follows my cursor at a certain rate. And then the text inside the button also follows the cursor, but at a, uh, at a slightly higher rate. So the text moves a bit faster than the button. Okay. And when we uh, hover out, the button kind of just snaps back into its original position and it's using a, a sort of elastic uh, easing curve there. Okay, so for that, let's go to right here. And we're going to use GSAP. Uh, if you don't know how to install GSAP, check out the previous lesson I showed you there. Uh, we're not going to use any kind of plugin, just plain old GSAP. So first of all, let's get our button. So we're going to create a, a constant magneto document query selector. Uh, it's actually a class magneto. Okay. Uh, next, let's get the text. So magneto text, and we're going to we're going to grab that uh, that span. And finally, let's do uh, the uh, debugger, I'm going to call it dbgr. Okay, so now let's do the mouse move stuff. So what happens when we move with our mouse cursor? Yeah, we're going to create a function called activate magneto. And we're going to pass in the event. And then we're going to work on the mouse leave stuff or what happens when we mouse out or the mouse cursor leaves the uh, the surface of the button. And in this case, we're gonna do a constant called a reset magneto. And that's also uh, going to be event. Okay, so we have two functions. Now let's attach some event listeners. So I'm going to say magneto add event listener for mouse move, we're going to activate magneto. And then for mouse, uh, sorry, leave, we're going to reset magneto. Okay, so now let's see what happens when we move over the button. And this is where the debugger comes in. So the debugger, uh, let me just go to the CSS and remove this display none uh, property, so we can actually see it on the page, right? Uh, the debugger is just a, a black box here in the corner, that's gonna display some numerical values for the position of the cursor, the position of the left side of the box of the button, the position of the cursor inside the button, and a few others. Because here's what we need to do when we move our cursor over the button, we need to shift its position relative to the position of our cursor, okay, in both axes, both on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis. And for that, let's first start by defining some, uh, some variables and some constants. So first variable is going to be the bound box. And that's going to be equal to magneto or magneto dot get bounding client rect. So this function gets the position of magneto on the page along with its width and its height. Then we're going to create a variable called magneto strength. We're going to put it at 40 and one for magneto text strength. And we're going to put it at 80. We're going to be using these variables. And we can actually you know what, we can set these as constants, we're going to use these to define uh, the rate of movement in relation to the position of the cursor, right? Uh, we're going to be using them as multipliers, you'll see that in just a little bit. Now, this is where it gets tricky. Because when we move with our mouse mouse cursor, we need to calculate a new x position that the button and the text will move to. And of course, a new y position. Now, how do we calculate those positions? Well, this is where the debugger comes in. And it's just going to help me explain things a little bit better. So let me just paste in some code. And 
let me show you what it's doing on the page, okay? You'll see that when I hover on the button, uh, most of the numbers in that debugger will change. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Okay. So first of all, it changes the position of the cursor, okay? And this is the position of the cursor on the x-axis on the page, okay? So right now, the cursor is positioned at 768 pixels on the x-axis. The next value is the left side of the box or the position of the left border of our button in relation to the page. So our button is positioned at 688 pixels from the left side of the page. Then we have our third value. And our third value is the cursor position inside the button. And how do we get that? We subtract the uh, position of the cursor, the client X, or sorry, we subtract the uh, left position of the uh, button from the position of the cursor. And that gives us the position in pixels of the cursor inside our button. So as you can see, right now it's at zero because I'm at the very left edge. And as I move it forward, we get to 160. And 160 being the 10 rems width we set in the CSS. Okay, so this works perfectly. Next up, we change that position to be relative to the total width. So how do we do that? We do basically the same thing as above, but we divide it by the total width of the button. So now, if you look here, it gives me a value between zero and one. Okay, of course, I can reach one if I position it exactly at the uh, at the edge here, but you get the idea. So that's how I'm I'm uh, doing this. I'm taking the cursor value or the cursor position inside the button that we calculated earlier, and I divide it by the total width of my button. And this so this one is just to to specify how many decimal points I want. And now the next one, the one called shifted, basically does the same thing, but it subtracts 0 0.5. And what that's doing is it allows me to calculate the position from the center. So as you can see, if my cursor is right in the center of the button, the shifted position is zero. If I move to the left, it's going to get me to minus 0 0.5. If I move it from the center to the right, it's going to get me to 0 0.5 or close enough. Now, I told you all of this because this shifted position is basically how we calculate the new X and the new Y. So let's go ahead and do that. Here in the constants, let's define new X as event.clientX. So this is the position of the cursor on the x axis minus uh, bound box dot left. Okay, we take this and we divide it by magneto dot offset width. All right, so by doing this, we're basically getting the relative value of the cursor or the relative position of the cursor to the total width of the button. And then we take these and we subtract 0 0.5 to get to this last value, the shifted position. And we do the same for the new Y, except here it's going to be client Y, bound box, dot top. And the offset is for the height. Okay, so now we got the new coordinates, or I should say the new values for X and Y. So now we can go in here. And we can use GSAP to move the uh, button and the text to its new position. So we're going to say move the button to its new position. So we're going to say GSAP to, we're going to target uh, Magneto, and we're going to say the following. Duration, let's say one second. And I'm going to move the X to new X, Y to new Y. 
And also, let's add an ease. And that ease is going to be power for ease out. And let's do the same for the button text. Magneto text, new X, new Y, same easing. So now let's give it a go. We can start seeing a little bit of movement, even though it's super, super tiny. And that's because the values that we're using for the movement are super small. And this is where these two constants come in. As I said earlier, we're going to be using these as multipliers. So now, instead of saying move the button to new x, we're going to say move it to new x times magneto strength. Same for the y. And then the text is going to be multiplied by magneto text strength times magneto text strength. Save. And now the movement is much more visible because we're using that shifted value that we calculated and we multiply it with what we had here, 40, 80, right? If I'm going to change this to 400, that's going to be a much bigger movement, right? That's going to follow our button even more. But for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to keep it at 40. Now, something weird is happening here, right? Our button, sure, it moves up and down and left to right, but our text moves along with it. And to fix that, what we need to do is set a display to flex inside the button and then just center everything. So justify content center, align item center, save. And now, now we get the effect that we want. So what was happening is that the text was not moving on its own. There were, right, um, transforms, you can see them right here. There are transforms, translate 3D to be exact, being applied to the button as well as the text. But before we applied display flex, it wasn't working. And you could achieve the same effect if, for example, you set the text to be positioned absolute. I'm not exactly sure why this happens, but I have a guess uh, that it's probably because display flex, uh, position absolute and stuff like that just creates a new stacking context for, uh, for the element. So by setting, in this case, display flex, we're allowing that text to become a flex child and we're allowing it to be transformed independently from its uh, its parent element so that's how this works basically we're calculating those new coordinates and they are being applied in real time as we're moving above our button they're being applied as translate 3Ds on the X and the Y axes. That's great. Now, what about when we leave the button? Because currently, it stays exactly as it was. So let's work on the uh, reset magneto function. And this is pretty simple. We just need to move the button to its default position. So we're going to say GSAP2 Magneto, duration 1, setting the X to 0, Y to 0. And for the ease, we're going to be using elastic.easeout. Again, if you want to learn more about easings in GSAP, uh, they have a, uh, a complete separate um, section in their documentation. Okay, so that's for the button. Let's do the same for the button text. So magneto text, uh, same thing, duration one, x, y, zero, and the same easing. So now save. And as soon as we leave our button, oops, it pops back into place. <laughs> that's a really cool effect. I really like that. And yeah, it took a little bit of calculation 
to um, to get it to work. So I hope this made sense, what I explained here. If it didn't, please leave a comment down below and I'll try to explain it in a different way. Now, earlier in this lesson, I mentioned scroll animations and how they can help you tell a better story or actually tell the same story in a better way. And I showed you some really cool examples, but how exactly do you create something like that? Well, let's find out in practical exercise number 18. And this is the demo we're going to be working with. It's a simple page uh, that has some gallery entries, basically, or some portfolio items, I, I guess you could call them. And as you can see, it's a totally static page, except for the uh, occasional uh, transition here and there. But we just scroll, we see the content, and that's about it. How can we add some more life into this? Well, what I would like to do is have these portfolio entries animate on scroll. So when I scroll down, I want the image to slide in from the right, I want the the text here to slide in from the left. So they will only reveal themselves once they are into view. And when I scroll back up, I want the same animation to run in reverse, right? This one, the image is gonna slide out, and the text is gonna slide out in the other direction. Now, there are a few ways to do this. And I'm just going to mention two of them. Uh, CSS scroll timeline is a great option uh, that uh, allows animation to be driven by a containers scroll position. So it's a great addition to CSS, except it's not supported anywhere. Just uh, it's an experimental feature which can be enabled in Chrome. So this is out of the table for now in right in November 2023. Uh, this is not yet supported. The other option which is supported in uh, a lot of uh, or in all modern browsers is the intersection observer API. This is used with JavaScript. And it basically uh, gives us um, a way to tap into the visibility and position of certain elements relative to the, um, you know, to the to the scroll position. But we're not going to use this either. Instead, we're going to use GSAP. Because GSAP has a plugin uh, that's called scroll trigger. It's this one right here. And that's going to allow us to uh, perform actions to uh, to run animations that are based on the scroll position on our page. But before we implement GSAP and this uh, very cool plugin, uh, let's first talk about smooth scrolling. And as you can see, this page scrolls uh, just in a normal way. But that's not enough if we want to create like a really cool experience for our website, we need to add some sort of smooth scrolling. And to do that, we can use a library called Lenis. So if we go to lenis.studiofright.com, uh, we can see that Lenis is a new smooth scroll library. And you can see it being applied to their website, of course. Essentially, this makes the scrolling experience much smoother. I'm not sure if you can see it on video, even though it's recorded in 60 FPS. But if you see it in like real life, right, compared to this, or compare that with this and the, the way this scrolls, yeah, it's a big difference. I, uh, I think you have to try it for yourself to, uh, uh, to see exactly um, how it is. But uh, let's go to GitHub. And here, it's actually really simple to, uh, to use, you just copy the script, and you paste it in your code. And let's actually go to exercise 18 here. And let's go all the way down here. And uh, I've actually already included here, Lenis, and I've already included GSAP and the scroll trigger min plugin. 
Now, there are two other components to make this work perfectly. First of all, you need to include this basic setup, right, for JavaScript. So let's do that here. Let's say Lenis smooth scrolling. And we're just going to paste that in. We don't really need this console log thing. And then uh, there is also, if we scroll down, there is also, there's also a recommended CSS we can use. And we can paste that in. We can say Lenis CSS. Now just paste that in. And uh, also there is a GSAP scroll trigger integration, the one that we're going to use. So we're actually better off copying this instead of the um, instead of the basic setup here. So in the JavaScript, actually delete this and paste in. Uh, the one that's uh, made specifically for GSAP. So now, if I scroll on this page, uh, that's much better. I can already see the difference. I'm not sure if you can do it too. But th there's sort of an easing when I when the mouse wheel stops, you know, it's like, it's not coming to an abrupt stop. It, it has an easing to it. And the whole thing is just much, uh, much smoother. So whenever you're doing animation projects, I highly recommend uh, you get uh, you get this library, it's pretty small, it doesn't uh, affect your performance in any significant way. So just just get this. All right. So with that out of the way, let's see how we can implement uh, GSAP to animate those uh, portfolio entries. First of all, let's have a look at the the HTML structure. Each portfolio entry is placed in a div with a class of entry. And the text is inside entry meta. The image is inside a figure with a class of entry media. So with that in mind, let's start by getting all of the entries, right? So we're going to create a constant entries. That's going to be document query selector all, and I'm going to select dot entry. And then for each of the entries, we're going to do the following. We're going to create a variable called entry meta. That's going to be equal to entry query selector. It's actually with double underscores. So entry meta, and then the entry media here. Okay. And we'll do the following. By default, we're going to set each uh, image to move to the right side by 100% of its width. So we're basically shifting the image to the right, and we're setting its opacity to zero. And we're taking the meta, the text, and we're shifting it to the left by using the same principle. So we're going to say GSAP set entry meta. So this is the uh, text, we're going to say x percent 100, or I should say minus 100 to go to the left. And opacity, whoa, opacity, zero. Okay, let's do the same for the media. This time the x percent is going to be 100. So now, if we take a look, everything is shifted to the right side of the page, right? I just cannot see them. So now, let's animate them into view. For that, I'm going to say GSAP2. Let's start with the entry meta. And here, I'm going to be using the scroll trigger plugin. And I'm going to pass in an object with the following properties. I'm going to set a trigger to entry. And the trigger is basically the element that starts the animation. And entry is like the parent element of my portfolio entry. And I'll show you uh, how that looks like in a visual way in uh, just a little bit. Next, we can set a start position. And the end, we'll set it to bottom 90%. And again, I'll explain that in just a little bit, because with GSAP scroll trigger, we can put down something called markers. And markers true, basically creates these 
uh, green and red markers at the start and end of each of my elements, as well as the uh, start and end of my scroller. So let's actually complete the, uh, the animation here. Uh, what I want to do is I want to say the X percent to be zero and the opacity to be one. So we're working with the entry meta for now, okay? But it's exactly the same for the entry media. So let's actually see how this works. So then on refresh, you'll see that as I scroll down, we saw a brief animation there of the uh, text coming in from the left side, right? There it is again on this uh, third project. But there is a another property we can use here. It's called scrub. And we're going to set that to true. And what this does is it ties the progress of the animation to the position of the cursor. So you'll see that as I'm scrolling up or down, that animation plays, pauses, and even goes in reverse. And let's do the same for the media. So you can see this better. Okay. So as I'm scrolling, yeah, you can see the media coming in. on all three of these. And as I scroll back up, it goes in reverse, and it even stops if I stop my scrolling. How cool is that? Now, let me explain a little bit how this works. And let's actually work with the entry media because it's a little bit easier to explain. And let's set the let's do top center and end, we'll do bottom center. We have two lines here, one red, one green, one corresponds to the scroller start one to the scroller end. And this is the position that I set here, the center center, this is basically a vertical position. Okay. So this code here says the following, when the top of my trigger reaches the center point, or whatever it is that I have set here, start the animation. And you can end the animation when the bottom of my trigger reaches whatever I have set here. So in this, in this case, I set the scroller start and scroller end both to the center. So watch what happens. As I scroll down, this is the start of my trigger, right? So when the start of the trigger aligns with the scroller start, then my entry media gets animated, the animation starts as I scroll down. Yeah, you can see the animation is running. And the animation will end when the end of my trigger reaches or aligns with scroller end. And just to be a bit more specific here, let's set these values to 20% and 80%. So now the scroller starts is at 20% of the page height, the scroller end is at 80% of the page height. And the same thing happens, right? When the start of my trigger aligns with the scroller start, the animation starts right there. And the animation ends when the end of my trigger aligns with the scroller end, just like this. Okay, and it happens the same for the other elements as well. Right, this is the second entry. And now the animation starts. And now the animation ends because these two have aligned. This is basically how stro uh, how a scroll trigger works, right? Now, uh, the values that I have set previously were top, bottom, and bottom 
90 percent and uh, these are just the values that i thought worked best for uh, this case but uh, feel free to adjust them as needed now finally uh, we've done the entry meta we've done the entry media but we're actually repeating a lot of stuff here so how about we make this code just a little bit more elegant so let's comment all of this we're gonna leave the two variables because they're just fine and let's write this entire code in a more elegant more concise way so for that we're gonna create a timeline gsap.timeline and we're gonna apply scroll trigger to the timeline itself so scroll trigger and the same thing trigger is going to be the entry start top bottom and end we're going to set bottom and 90 percent and the most important part scrub true and if we want we can uh, also display the markers just for debugging purposes so now we can say timeline from two and we're going to apply it first to the entry meta and being from two we need to pass in two objects right the first one is going to say x percent so we're starting from minus 100 percent and opacity is zero two x percent zero and opacity one and we're going to do the same for the entry media except it's going to be from 100 to zero and from zero to one so now watch what happens right same thing uh hold on two fr from two no sorry this is supposed to be tl okay so tl from two in both cases okay so now it does exactly the same thing right except for the meta so for some reason this doesn't work so let's see why that is oh okay i got it it's because we're using a timeline and uh, events actually happen in succession so we actually want to uh, run these animations both at the same time and for that it's uh, really easy we can pass in another parameter here in the form of this the less than symbol and this basically means that run this animation at the same time as the one before it okay so now both animations run correctly and we can get rid of the markers we don't need those anymore and that is our smooth scrolling animation now uh, the one thing that you might have noticed we're getting a bit of um, of a scroll bar here on the bottom so uh, to prevent that we can go to our CSS we can go to the uh, the body element and we can say overflow uh, X hidden okay and that's gonna fix this issue uh, this was being caused by the elements being moved like outside of our viewport Right, and that's how you create a very nice scrolling, smooth scrolling animation with GSAP and Lennis. All right, so in this lesson, we learned about interactive animations, which are triggered by user actions, such as clicking, hovering, or scrolling. And there are a few good reasons for using this type of animation. First being that interactive animations grab attention and create a dynamic experience keeping users more engaged these animations are also great for better storytelling scroll animations in particular can unfold stories or reveal information in an engaging way making content more memorable interactive animations can add life and personality to a website helping to strengthen brand identity and stand out from static sites by creating an emotional connection and let's not forget these animations can encourage users to explore and interact more leading to improved 
engagement metrics, and longer site visits. On the technical side, we learned how to use the Scroll Trigger plugin from GSAP to create animations that are tied into the scroll position. We also worked with a library called Lenis, which is a great solution for creating smooth scrolling on your website. And it also works great with GSAP. Now, interactive animations offer so much variety that we could probably spend the whole day talking about them. But time is limited and we're nearing the end of this course. Before we do that, though, there is one particularly popular animation type that I want to cover, and that is parallax. I'm sure you've heard about it before, so let's check it out. Okay, so according to Wikipedia, parallax is the displa displacement... Hold on. Uh, parallax is a displacement or difference in the apparent position of an object viewed along two different lines of sight and is measured by the angle or half angle of inclination between those two lines. I have no idea what that means. So let me explain it in a different way. Imagine you're sitting in a car looking out the window. You see the trees and the post signs and the squirrels zooming by really fast. But the houses and hills and mountains in the distance seem to move slowly. In fact, the further away from you it is, the slower it moves. That's essentially what parallax is all about. And when it's adapted to web design, parallax is a technique where background elements move slower than foreground elements. And this creates an illusion of depth. It adds a, a dynamic and almost a 3D feel uh, to, uh, to a website. It's like having different layers moving at different speeds. Pretty cool if uh, you, know, you want to add a bit of flair to a website. So let me show you a few real world examples to understand what I'm on about. The first one is kooks.co.uk, and you'll see that as we scroll down, we get a little bit of parallax because uh, we have the background elements that are moving slower than the foreground elements, right? So the, uh, in this case, the pepper is moving a lot faster than the, um, the stuff that's behind it. And this kind of layered animation is really, really cool. It really adds uh, a, sense, a sense of uh, depth to this whole page. Uh, next, we have this bit, Climb Whales. And you see that as I scroll, it kind of feels like I'm seeing this image from a lower perspective, you know, because it, uh, the, the elements here move at a different rate. You can see the elements closer to me, like the person and uh, this, uh, this rock here, they move a lot faster than the elements in the background, like the mountains, right? So that creates a nice uh, parallax effect. Pretty cool. Uh, then we have this one, Firewatch, which is apparently a game. And this has a really nice parallax effect, right? Notice as you scroll up and down, it's a, a little bit buggy, to be honest. Sometimes it works uh, properly, sometimes it doesn't. But the effect itself is amazing. You have this uh, beautiful illustration, layered illustration, and uh, on scroll, it's like you're changing perspective. Super, super cool. Uh, we also have this website. I don't know it's what it's about because it's in a language I don't understand. Uh, I think it's from a movie or something. But uh, yeah, this is yet another type of parallax effect where the foreground content, which is represented by, uh, you know, the text, yeah, this just scrolls by and the background content stays put or it scrolls at a, at a much lower speed. And this is another implementation of parallax. You can probably see it here a little bit. 
And then we have exercise 17. Wait a minute, this is one of our own. That's correct. We have what I consider to be parallax here because if you remember on this button, uh, we're moving the text and the button itself. We're making them follow the cursor at a different rate. And if we think about the text as being the foreground and the button being the background, yeah, they move at a different speed. So in my mind, I might be wrong, but in my mind, this is also a parallax effect. Okay, so we've seen some real world examples of parallax. Now we need to create our own, right? This is how it works in this course. So for that, we'll go to practical exercise number 19. Now, before we get started, just a quick mention, uh, parallax websites can be super complicated. So in this example, we're going to create something super simple so that you understand the basics. Okay. So here's what I want to make. We have this uh, fictional website that has a big illustration here. This is an SVG illustration that I got from Envato Elements. And further down, we just have a bit of content. And it's basically about uh, some books, about nature, about exploration. As I said, it's, uh, it's a completely fictional page. Now, I would like to animate this illustration on scroll, right? Because it's, it has different layers. And I want to give this whole page a sense of 3D, a sense of depth, right? So here's how we're going to do that. For now, uh, we are, we have a section with an idea of hero, okay? And we are loading that illustration as an SVG, as the background. But if we want to animate the individual layers of that, we have to load them separately. So for now, let's uh, uncheck that. And let's go ahead and create the different layers. So the way we're going to do that is very simple. I have the illustration open here in Figma. And I went ahead and group, uh, grouped the relevant pieces together. So we have a couple of layers. And let me just unhide all of them. Layer one, and we're going from the farthest to the closest. Layer one is just this, the night sky with the moon and the birds and the stars. Okay. Layer two is the furthest uh, mountain range, I guess you could call it. Layer three is a bit closer to us. It has the wolf, it has some trees. Layer four is again, even closer to us. It has a lot of trees. And then layer five is the closest. It has the wolf, it has a rock, it has grass, and it has a tree. And if you look at the original, um, you know, structure of this, it's of course, layered, but it's not layered in a, a logical way that works for us, right? So for example, the stars are kind of grouped together. We have a group one that's something. We have the birds, we have the wolf, mountain two, three, four. So I wasn't going to use this structure. Instead, I just picked the elements that I needed and placed them in uh, my individual groups. Okay, now here's how you export this. You start by hiding all of the layers and just leaving the first one. Then you select the image, you export as SVG, and you export it in the illustrations folder as wolves bg onesvg of course. So we'll save that. Then you hide that layer and you bring up the second layer, just the second layer. Okay. So the idea is to export these layers on their own. Let's do that. And this is going to be layer two. Hide that, show the third, export again. That's going to be layer three. That's going to be layer four. And finally, 
that's going to be layer 5. So now, you know, we can hide or uh, show all of these and we're done in Figma. Now, we are left with these SVGs, right? That's the first, that's the second, third, fourth, and fifth. And they both have the same size, basically, because we exported the uh, parent frame. So now, let's go ahead and load these in our page. So I'm going to go right here. Remember, previously, we used the hero to set a background image. Well, right now, uh, we're actually going to use some divs. So let's do this uh, div with an ID of, we'll call it wolves wrapper. And inside, I'm going to create five divs with an ID of wolves bg one, two, three, four, five. And I'm also going to set an attribute called data speed. Okay. And data speed will be used as a multiplier to dictate the speed at which each of these layers is scrolling. So I'm going to do like 0 0.2 on the first one. I'm going to do 2, 4, 6, and 10. And you'll notice that as we're getting to the layers, layers that are closer to us, we're increasing the data speed. This is essential for the parallax to work properly. Okay, now let's go to the CSS part, where, as you can see, I've already included Lenis, both in CSS and in JavaScript, okay? And in JavaScript, actually, I didn't include it. Uh, that was an oversight, let me do that right now. We're including Lenis for smooth scrolling, yeah? And we're including the version that's, um, you know, made for uh, GSAP's uh, scroll trigger. And I'm also including GSAP and the scroll trigger plugin, just like we did in the previous lesson. Now, if we do a refresh, yeah, we get the smooth scrolling, but uh, we don't see any image just yet. So let's go back to the CSS. And let's do the following. First of all, we'll target the hero and we'll set a position relative because we want to position the wolf's wrapper, this bit, uh, absolutely, yeah? So wolf's wrapper, I'm going to give it a width of 100%, a height of 100 dynamic viewport height to fill up the entire uh, height of the viewport, position absolute, save that. And I'm also gonna set pointer events to none, just so that we cannot interact with those images, or those images uh, don't uh, interact or don't uh, prevent us from interacting with any of the elements that are positioned above them. Now, let's select all of these divs. For that, we can uh, use a clever uh, attribute selector in CSS, where the ID basically uh, contains the words wolves bg dash. So for these, we're going to do the following background repeat none, background size cover, and background position. This is important bottom, center. Essentially, I want to set each of the SVGs we exported as a background image to each of these divs. So I'm just uh, targeting all of them and setting some properties like don't repeat the background, uh, scale up the image to cover the entire picture and set its position to the bottom and center. Okay, next let's set with 100%, height 100, uh, display viewport, or sorry, dynamic viewport height. Uh, position is going to be also absolute because I want to stack them one on top of the other. And I want them all to start from the top and the left. Cool. Okay, so now we just need to load up the images. So let's start with this wolves bg1, which is the first div here. Let's say background image, URL, illustration slash 
Wolves BG1. Save that, refresh, and there it is, the image in all of its glory. However, it's covering the contents of my, uh, my hero. So let's actually add a Z index of minus one on all of these uh, containers, all right? And that's gonna place it right below uh, whatever content I have in the hero area. So now let's start adding the other images. So background two, right? So now the other image is added on top. Nice. And let's do the same for the rest. That's three, four, and five. And there we go. We've just reconstructed the original image we had by using five different images. We now have a layered image that we can play around with with GSAP. So let's do that. Let's go all the way down here. In our own script tag, we're going to start by getting the wolves wrapper. And then let's get the five backgrounds. So constant wolves bg is wolves wrapper, query selector all. And I'm going to target the divs using the exact same selector that I did in CSS wolves bg dash. All right. Next, let's uh, create a timeline. And we're going to define scroll trigger. And the trigger itself will be the wolves wrapper. So this, uh, the main container, the start is going to be at the very top. And I'm going to set scrub the true. Okay, so that's our timeline. Now, for each of the backgrounds, we're going to do this So wolves BG for each. And we're going to call this just BG. We're going to do constant BG speed, we're going to get that uh, this uh, data attribute here, right? So uh, BG dot get attribute data speed. So now all we have to do is say TL two, so timeline two, we're going to animate the BG. And we're going to make it go Y. So on the Y axis, we're going to do uh, I don't know, something like 60 times background speed. And let's set a duration of two. And let's see how it works. So now as we scroll, oh, so something's working, but not quite right. And that's because we're using a timeline. Okay, and being a timeline, the animations will run in succession. If I want them to run at the same time, I can pass in a, a parameter here, which basically tells GSAP, okay, run all of these animations in the timeline at the same time. Okay, so now, oh, but this is a different story. Now, every single layer is animated at the same time and we get a super cool parallax effect. Look at that. And you can play around with this number, you can do like 20. And that's going to be a much more subdued um, animation, or you can do like 120. And that's going to be a much more dramatic animation, as you can see here. But uh, in my case, I'm just going to leave it at 60. Because I feel that it works perfect for me. Uh, you can also play around with the different background speeds for each of these elements. So if you want the background, like the first layer to move a little bit faster, you can increase the number here. Or maybe you don't like the third layer. Maybe you want to move it slower, then decrease the number and so on and so forth. You can, you know, double the speed of the front element, and that's going to move at a much higher rate than uh, than the others. All right, that's, uh, that's super cool. So that's an easy way of creating a parallax effect. Now before we wrap things up, uh, if you remember from the original 
image here, we had this kind of vignette effect going on at the top. And let's go ahead and add that. I'm going to go down here and say, oops, wolves wrapper. And I'm going to be using an after pseudo element, or I'm just going to set uh, just blank content position, absolute, uh, inset zero to cover the entire page z index minus one. And then uh, we'll just do a background, uh, a linear gradient going direction is going to be 180 degrees. And it's going to go from uh, just black. So zero, 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 let's say with a 0 0.8 opacity. And that's going to start like at the very top. And we go to zero, 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 with zero opacity at about half at the halfway point kind of so we're going from black 80% uh, on the top to uh, complete transparent right about the middle size, or the middle portion of the image. And if you're uh, still unclear about how the uh, scroll speed or the scroll trigger works, you know, we, you can always add the markers and um, see exactly how that works. We basically have the start and end of our trigger, which is the container that holds all of these images. And I set the start of scroll trigger here on the top, which basically means my animation starts when uh, when the start here aligns with the scroller start, which is right at the top. So it starts right as I uh, begin scrolling the page. Wow, how cool is that? Okay, so let's comment these. And we are done. All right, so in this lesson, we explored parallax. So picture this, you're in a car watching nearby trees rush by quickly while distant mountains move slowly. That's parallax. Closer objects seem to move faster than far ones. This effect is used in web design to make background elements move slower than those in the foreground, creating a sense of depth and adding a 3D feel to web pages. One of the ways of adding parallax to a website is to split up an image into multiple layers, load them individually, and then animate them at different speeds when scrolling. And with that, we covered the final animation type in our course. Now, before we wrap things up, there's one more thing we need to address. And that is the uh, interplay or the relationship between motion design and responsive design. Now, all the demos you've seen so far have not been optimized for mobile layouts. Chances are, if you open some of these demos on your smartphone, the layouts will be broken. And that's okay. Uh, this course is about motion design, not about how to make layouts responsive. And even though it would have been an easy task, I preferred to focus on the animation side of things. Now, with that said, when using motion to enhance your web project, you do need to consider responsive web design. And there are three main reasons for that. The first is device limitations. Mobile screens are smaller, which means less space for large complex animations. Plus, large and complex animations uh, can clutter your UI and um, they can confuse the user, therefore negating any benefit you might have gained from creating those animations in the first place. Let's do a quick uh, comparison between the desktop version of Doc Studio and the mobile one. I've showed you this before in this course, so I'm sure you're familiar with how the uh, desktop version of the website looks like, right? We have these uh, fancy animations, uh, they're interactive, uh, they look great, okay? Now, if we switch to the mobile version, well, that's a different story altogether. You know, we, we can still refresh and we get the loading animation. 
but we don't get the main animations that we saw on the desktop version, right? It's much more static here because, you know, of the performance reasons I'll be mentioning in just a little bit. Uh, we still have uh, some animations, like for example, if we uh, open up the menu, you know, we have those nice transitions, but it's nowhere near the um, interactiveness of the desktop version. Something else to consider is the interaction, because on mobile devices, you rely on touch gestures, like tap, swipe, uh, pinch, right? So you need to design your animations to complement those gestures. Let's take a look at Vool Studio on desktop. And if we scroll down, the stuff that I want to show you is uh, right here. It's the um, slider for the testimonials. Now, on desktop, uh, you're cycling through the testimonials by using the before and after buttons, right? There is no other way of doing that or with, you know, with drag, with anything. Now, if we look at the same website on mobile and we scroll down to the same area, yeah, we still have the two buttons, which we can tap to cycle between the testimonials. But in addition, we also have a swipe gesture. We can swipe left or right to cycle between these. So great example of how uh, the animations here have been adapted to the medium they're being displayed on. Now, reason number two for considering responsive web design is performance. Generally, mobile devices have less processing power than desktops. So uh, using heavy animations can cause lag, they can drain battery, and they can also negatively impact the data consumption. Imagine you're using a lot of um, heavy assets like unoptimized videos, right? Those are going to take like really a really long time to uh, to download and will definitely impact the data consumption. Now, here are a few basic principles you can use to create motion while keeping performance in mind. The first one is about file size. You should always make your files as small as possible. Either it's videos, images, Lottie files, or any kind of file used for animations then you should be using CSS transforms because CSS transform properties, uh, including translate, scale and rotate are designed for efficiency using less system resources. Uh, these are ideal for smooth animations on low power devices because they leverage hardware acceleration, which means they use the GPU for better performance. Next up, you should use JavaScript only when necessary, because while JavaScript provides more control, it's often less efficient than CSS for animations. So you should always reserve JavaScript for complex animations where CSS can't do the job. For simple things, stick to CSS. Finally, uh, let's look at reason number three for considering responsive design and that is accessibility. And this is a topic that uh, can be debated for hours, but essentially it boils down to this. Not all users can interact with web content in the same way. Uh, some might have uh, visual or motor impairments that um, make navigating, you know, standard layouts uh, or even animations challenging, right? So, Keep it simple, use uh, you know, relatively simple layouts and uh, make those layouts consistent across devices. And um, that will definitely help users with disabilities uh, navigate and understand the website more easily. On top of that, keep in mind that some of your users can have vestibular motion disorders. For them, animations such as uh, scaling or panning large objects can cause uh, discomfort. And I remember having a similar issue many, many years ago when I had an inner ear problem. And, you know, besides the uh, usual, you know, loss of balance and all that, I remember that any flashing or sudden movement on the screen 
would you know give me headaches and make me dizzy that's why in most operating systems nowadays you have the uh, some sort of setting for uh, reducing motion so for example in ios uh, you would go to the settings you would go to accessibility and then to motion and right up here you have this toggle that says reduce motion. And in the case of iOS 17, which I'm using here, it says that it reduces the motion of the user interface, including the parallax effect of the icons. So uh, this is what it looks like if, for example, I swipe up to reveal the home page, right? It looks something like this. You get a nice scale down parallax effect for the icons. And uh, again, when you open up an app, it kind of scales from the bottom. Uh, to the uh, to the screen but when I tap in reduce motion yeah those animations are kind of replaced by a fade like I, I hope uh, the animation is captured here on the uh, on the screen recording but yeah this is basically how uh, you do it in iOS 17 and the same thing can be done on Windows on Android on Mac even and I think even on Linux, I remember uh, seeing uh, or hearing about a setting like that. Now, apart from the obvious effects that um, uh, you get on an operating system, this type of setting can be used by website developers. And here's how you do that. There is a CSS media feature called prefers a reduced motion, which looks like this. Essentially, you create your animations as intended and then inside the media feature you can specify what changes you want to make for users who opted for the reduced motion on their device in this example we're switching from a bounce animation to a fade and uh, how you want that reduced animation to play is really up to you you can replace it with something else you can remove it entirely or you can do something like this where you basically set the animation and transition duration to a thousand of a second and change the animation repeat count to one so it only runs once and you would do this for every single element on your page so in this lesson we learned that responsive web design should be a major consideration when it comes to creating motion for the web first Think about device limitations and keep animations neat and complementary to mobile interactions like tapping and swiping, as mobile screens have limited space and different interaction methods. Then also think about performance. You need to create smooth, battery efficient animations on mobile by minimizing file sizes and using CSS transforms, while reserving JavaScript for complex tasks. Finally, for accessibility purposes, create designs that are both simple and consistent to cater to different user preferences and implement the prefers reduced motion media feature in CSS to provide a comfortable experience for users who are sensitive to motion. If you do these things, you'll be one step closer to uh, providing a great user experience for all of your users, which is something we should all be aiming for. And that concludes this mega course on motion design for the web. Now, question for you, what's the biggest challenge you're facing when implementing motion for the web? I would really like to hear from you and hopefully this course helped you with that particular problem and maybe answered some of your questions either way let me know down in the comments and if you like this video don't forget to uh, hit the like button and subscribe uh, to the Envato Tuts Plus uh, channel for more free content like this and uh, before I go just a quick reminder that you can download a starter kit for all 19 exercises so you can code alongside me while watching this course. Well, it's time for me to sign off. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, take care and be safe.